It's all Thank yours. You. Thank you, Gail. Um, so we start out today minus uh, the chair and chair of the planning commission and the chair of the uh, joint group. So um, we will we will go ahead. I call the meeting to order, and uh, I will go through and call roll. And so people can. I'm hoping that people will introduce themselves. Um, and sort of let us know where you're from and uh, what group you represent. And we'll go ahead. First of all, as I said, Andy is excused. Jim Allegria. Uh, hello, I'm uh, Jim Allegria. I'm with the Countywide Citizens Advisory Committee, and I live in Astoria. Cheryl Johnson. Good morning, Cheryl Johnson. I'm with the Countywide Citizen Advisory, and I represent the folks up in Northeast for uh, the County for CAC. Charles Dice. I know I saw him. Well, we'll go on, I'll come back to him. Andrea Mazzarella, I know is not going to be here because she sent comments. Uh, Nadia Gardner will not be here. Chris Farrar. Good morning. I'm Chris Farrar. I serve as one of the seven county planning commissioners, and I'm a resident of Astoria. Jason Crossshower. Jason, are you here? I am a little technologically challenged with the Zoom stuff. Uh, Jason oh, Crossshower, no, no, no. <laughs> Class of County Planning Commission. Uh, I live in the uh, Westlake area, so the Clotsop Plains. Thank you. Good to see you. Lam Kwang? Yes, good morning. Uh, this is Lam Kwang, uh, one of the county uh, planning commissioners out here in Lewis and Clark. Thank you, Lam. Carrie Johnson? So... Carrie's not with us right now, but thank you so much. Um, next on our agenda is public comment and input. Yes. Uh, Pat Corcoran, Living Astoria, a member what? of the County Sorry, Wide Pat. Advisory Committee. Good morning. Hey. Everyone. All right, my, oh. my bad on that one, Jan. I forgot him and Susanna because I forgot we had two new planning commission members. So oh, I right. counted the, the numbers. <laughs> How awful. Susanna, introduce yourself as well. There, I had to unmute. Hi, Susanna Gladwin here. I have a farm and forestry lands in Jewel, Oregon, and represent the Southeast Jewel Elsie Vine Maple as well as Seaside Rural Area. Thanks. Thank you. And I see that we have at least from, from what I can see, two members of the public here. Would you like to introduce yourselves? And uh, since next on our agenda is public comment and input, whoops, I left somebody else. Hi, Clark Power, new planning commission member uh, from the Warrington Claps of Pains area. Thank you, Clark. Again, I didn't, I don't think I had your name down. So welcome to the group. So we now have two people from the class of Plains. We have not uh, officially had anybody representing, so that's good. Thank you. Now to the public. Uh, I see Anna Moritz and Pat, uh, Pam Mc, Matson McDonald are, uh, are with us. Do you, either of you want to speak? Um, I won't be presenting anything, but my name is Anna Moritz. I am a planning commission member in, for the city of Cannon Beach. Um, I won't be able to stay for the whole meeting, but I'm hoping to monitor as much as possible what you guys do today. Thanks. Thank you. And Pamela, do you have anything to say? And I'm not sure who Galaxy S7 is but uh, we do have somebody else online. Well, if, if there are no public comments, then we can move ahead to, uh, 
to our first item on the agenda. And we actually are, are a little early. I would tell you also that uh, Gail has told us that she has a conflict at two o'clock. So we have to be done by two o'clock. And Can? Uh, yes. Yeah, this is, so the Galaxy S7, that's Charles Dice. Oh, Charles, right. Sorry, I... We're not seeing your handsome face. Well, I'm doing three things at once, and I'm on my cell phone, which I nor am not normally, so I'll, you'll just have to bear with me, I guess. Great. Okay. Thank you, Charles. You're welcome. Well, then, Gail, shall we move on to uh, the, our first item, review of Goal 10, housing? I would note that we have co written comments from three people having to do with that, Nadia, Charles, and Andrea Mozzarella uh, specifically. And actually, Chris also had comments, which uh, so we have to somehow fold those comments in. I assume that you've all read them. Want to go ahead, Gail? Sure. Thank you, Jan. So statewide planning goal 10 uh, is focused on housing. And I know that this is a topic that uh, not only the county has spent time working on over the past four or five years, but many of the cities as well. And so statewide planning goal 10 basically says that uh, its purpose is to provide for the housing needs of the citizens of Oregon. And that translates down to our local level here at the county. Um, because we are a smaller rural county, a lot of the requirements that you would see in larger cities, and even now with the city of Astoria having reached the 10,000 population mark, uh, those requirements are not going to apply to the unincorporated areas. So for example, we don't have to do an inventory of buildable lands. We don't have to do a housing needs analysis. We don't have to do a housing production strategy. So in some ways, our mandated requirements are much easier. Uh, it doesn't necessarily alleviate us from looking at the issue or uh, trying to provide housing in, in ways that we can. But we face a lot more restraints than you would see if you were in, in an urban incorporated area. So, um, for example, you know, a lot of our lands uh, in the county are zoned for resource use, primarily forest, but also EFU exclusive farm use lands. And so that limits uh, the area of land that we have available uh, for, for housing construction. And th those lands that are available are going to be further limited by availability of water and or sewer and or capability to support septic systems. Uh, and then we have to think about transportation. Uh, as further people move out, their transportation costs may go up. Um, you're going to have more trips on the road because our public transportation system can't cover all of the unincorporated areas with any regularity. So there are other impacts that happen as you spread development out from an incorporated or urban area. Um, in the uh, draft of goal 10 that we put forward to you today, there, as I talked about, there's been a lot of discussion about this. And in 2018, uh, the county and the five cities hired uh, Angelo Planning Group and Johnson Economics to prepare a housing strategies report. And that final report was issued in January of 2019. And we know that the data in that report, which is based off the 2010 census, was obviously nine years dated at the time it was put together, but we didn't have the 2020 census data ready. And so in the meantime, kind of in that gap area, PSU came forward with their population forecast which uh, are also included in the report. And you'll see that compared to what the actual 2020 count was, uh, the forecast under predicted or under forecast what the population growth in the county would be. So just with that right out of the gate, we know we're working with some constraints, some out dated data, uh, and obviously pandemic changed how the world operates, where people live, where people work from. Uh, and so that has had some impact on what the work that we're going to be doing moving forward. And it's important that we keep that in the back of our heads. Um, when the housing study came out, most of their recommendations were focused primarily on the incorporated areas. Uh, they were looking at things like cottage cluster development, parking reductions. Uh, they were looking at 
maximizing density. So if you had a zone that uh, had a minimum density of say five units per acre, making sure that development did, a, did not occur at a, at a density that was less than that. And so really trying to focus on maximizing the options we already had available. The study from 2019 also showed that in terms of what they analyzed, and this was not a formal uh, buildable lands inventory, but the lands that they inventoried showed that there was adequate property in the county for residential development, both in the incorporated areas and the unincorporated area. And that overall, the number of built units was sufficient to match the number of population and projected population. Now there is discussion about uh, the fact that we do have a lot of homes that sit vacant for part of the year because they may be vacation rentals or seasonal homes for people who don't primarily live in Clatsop County. There's also discussion about the impact of short-term rentals on the housing stock that's available for long-term rentals and for workforce housing. Uh, so those are some trends that we're working through as well. And then um, to also uh, kind of throw another element into the mix. In uh, 2019, the Oregon legislature adopted House Bill 2003, and it was primarily focused on uh, this middle house, missing middle housing that everybody talks about, where there's a gap between the housing products that are available uh, for sale or for rent and the income levels and the needs of the people who are looking for housing. And so there's kind of this middle area somewhere between, you know, subsidized housing and the upper end portion of the market where we're looking at maybe things like duplexes or triplexes, um, maybe smaller homes that people can either rent or own as starter homes or starter dwellings uh, to kind of get people established. And then you can also free up some of the other housing uh, that may be available at the lower end uh, so that people can now, you know, utilize that housing. And so there's a lot of discussion about that. And uh, that's what House Bill 2003 was primarily focused on. But as part of that bill, there was also a requirement that Oregon Housing and Community Services uh, pull together a methodology on a regional basis to look at uh, where we were short on housing units. And so they completed that initial effort and uh, put out a, a final report in March of 2021 that broke the uh, state down into five or six different regions. And so here on the North Coast, uh, they identified that over the next um, 20 years out through 2040, that our region, which consists of uh, Clatsop, Tillamook, and Lincoln County, and I think Columbia County's in there as well, uh, would have a deficit of over 17,000 residential units over that 20 year period. And that includes dwelling units that we're short on today, plus new dwelling units that would be required over the planning horizon to accommodate uh, new residents into the uh, uh, multi-county area. And so there's a lot of discussion in that in your report as well. And the regional housing needs analysis allocated those 17,000 units uh, to each of the incorporated cities in that multi-region area. And you'll notice that it didn't allocate any of the needed units to the unincorporated areas of the counties. And the reason for that uh, primarily is that when you look at goal 14, which deals with urbanization, uh, goal 14 really channels intense development and increased density to the incorporated areas, the areas within the urban growth boundaries and areas that can be urbanized, uh, which are areas which are um, inside a growth urban growth boundary, but may not have the full uh, range of services yet, such as water or sewer, uh, but in the future will be eligible for that and at some point will become urbanized as opposed to rural. So um, that's another thing that we need to keep in mind is as we're looking at our housing policies and our discussion, you know, we all want to step up to the plate and, you know, do as much as we can in unincorporated areas. But we also have to realize that we have uh, limitations under the urbanization goal 14, 
we're going to have some limits under goal 11, which is public utilities and services. And that goal limits where the county can and cannot um, have sewer service, how sewer service is expanded, it covers uh, water provision. Uh, and then we have to keep in mind also goal six, which is air, water, and land quality, and uh, making sure that when we're promoting development or looking at increasing development intensities in the unincorporated area, that we're constantly mindful of the carrying capacity of the land and the water and the air where those properties are located. So there's uh, many different moving parts that play into goal 10. Uh, the real important thing to keep in mind is that we are as an unincorporated area, we will need to work very closely and coordinate our efforts with the incorporated areas to make sure that we're channeling our growth to the correct places uh, and that we're providing ways to work with and support with the incorporated areas who are gonna bear a lot of the responsibility for making sure that those housing units that we need uh, are gonna be provided uh, in a timely manner and at the most efficient cost for everyone. So that was a little bit of a rambling introduction to goal 10. And um, really, I'm just here to answer any questions that you might have. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention, we did take goal 10 to the Board of Commissioners for some review, both in December of last year, and then again on March 2nd this year. Uh, they had a lot of questions which are summarized in your memo. Uh, the last go around, uh, there was, uh, an emphasis on making sure, again, that we are coordinating our efforts with the cities, uh, some talk about the population projections that we uh, reviewed earlier during my discussion this morning, uh, some additional discussion about community organizations that are also working on the housing front, such as Community Action Team and the Northwest Oregon Housing Authority, uh, and how they can partner with the counties and the incorporated areas to help in this housing provision that we need. And um, I think those were the big ones, but they are summarized in the memo that's included with your draft of Goal 10. So at with that, I'm going to stop and pause for questions if anybody has any for me. Gail? Yeah, Jim? Um, I have a question. Has any of the cities even approached the county to begin any type of discussions, uh, even informally, on uh, the expansion of the UBGs or where that could possibly occur? Um, Cannon Beach staff actually have contacted the city, uh, not necessarily to specifically talk about a UGB expansion, but to uh, build on the conversation that their county or city commission has been having about uh, regional housing needs and how we can all partner together to um, begin this discussion. And uh, Commissioner Thompson, myself, and the county manager will be meeting with uh, Cannon Beach staff and a member of their uh, city commission, I believe, on April 1st to uh, have our initial discussion with them. Thank you. Yes, Christopher. Go ahead. Uh, Chris. With, with regard to uh, changing urban growth boundaries. I was wondering if an urban growth boundary has to be continuous or if you could enlarge one of the city's urban area with a satellite urban growth boundary. Yeah, I've never been involved in a boundary expansion. I would suspect, but I would have to verify that I think that has to be contiguous. So you couldn't have your growth boundary here and then have an unincorporated area and then say, oh, this is going to be part of city X over here. I think they're going to have to be contiguous. That would be an interesting question because I, I haven't heard anything about uh, Astoria um, making any moves that way, but I know that the the area across the old Young's Bay Bridge, I think, does get some service from Astoria. Is there anyone else who has a comment or question? 
Uh, I have a question, Gail, uh, and I, you know, if I, tell me if I'm speaking up too much when I'm trying to be chair, but um, do you think it's the kind of thing that the city should initiate with the county to have a, a larger discussion on the whole issue of housing or um, is there anything to be gained from that or, or would the county initiate um, any you know, a, a collaborative effort to try to deal with many of the same issues. Yeah, so um, speaking specifically about an expansion of an urban growth boundary, it's not simply a matter of a city or a county saying, you know, we're just, we, we need to do this because we need more housing. So when a city goes through a, a boundary expansion, they do have to coordinate with the county because uh, obviously they're going to be taking in unincorporated land, but they also have to base that, that need or that expansion on the need to provide additional land for a specific purpose. So they'd have to show that over the next 20 years, they don't have sufficient land to uh, meet their housing requirements based on their population projections, or they don't have enough commercial or industrial lands to be able to meet their supply and for the next 20 years. So they have to have a very specific purpose and they have to demonstrate a need in order to um, get that process all the way approved through the county and the state. Um, I think, you know, it's probably more appropriate for a city to maybe initiate that discussion, um, but I, there's no prohibition against the county also making overtures to a city to talk about and uh, look at residential needs over the next 20 years and talk about ex boundary expansions. Thank you. Any other, you know, Patrick? <clears throat> Excuse me, thank you. <clears throat> In the context of boundary expansions, obviously I brought it up before, and um, <clears throat> we are right now looking to increase the density of residential development in our most hazardous zones. So as we look forward, and if we're looking for boundary extensions, I certainly think a fundamental need unique to our county is, <clears throat> is once we start, if we were to sort of take off the, the map, those parcels that are in the highest zone, um, that puts even more pressure on the existing land. I, I would not want it to be abused just to kind of develop everywhere. But I do think that if a strategic plan between the cities and the counties identified areas of high, higher ground that would be uh, suitable for a, the number of places that it would take in an area that is not in the worst of the zones, I think that's a foundational motivation to look at boundary uh, adjustments. Um, in what we're doing now at the Seaside High School site, <clears throat> that's been rezoned R2. And so we moved the school to the top of the hill and now the families are gonna live back in the hazard zone. In Gerhardt, they're rezoning, looking to rezone the school property to have more homes in the inundation zone. That's what we're doing today. Um, and so I think there's actually a, a motivation and a legitimate reason to look for, towards boundary extensions. Either that or look towards dramatically increase height, lim increase height limits within uh, the existing areas out of the zone. So again, broken record a little bit, but um, what we're doing now is not in the right direction, in my opinion. And the only way to go is up where it's safe or over where it's safer. Uh, yeah. Yes, Chris. Thank you, Pat. Yeah, those are good comments, Pat. I agree with what you're saying. And this is more or less uh, uh, opening up a little expansion on that discussion. I was wondering, how much attention has been given by either the cities or the county to looking at that buildable lands inventory that was included in the housing reports to better qualify those properties as to which are outside the tsunami zone, outside of a high landslide susceptibility or active sliding area out of a flood zones, et cetera. That seems like a critical first step to go through that process and winnow out the buildable lands map that we have available now to those that are really 
properties that could be built upon for residences. Yes, Pat. And a key aspect of that conversation is which tsunami zone is the one. Um, I'm on the record as saying our evacuation maps that show the worst case scenario are not proper for this purpose. What we're seeing though are DLCD has a draft uh, product out showing sea level rise 30 to 50 years, not that far out. And where those areas are likely to be flooded, they're pretty much the same with the purple areas in the tsunami Tim, Tim's maps. So our sea level rise, um, tsunami, where those geographic areas intersect, I think is a safe place to say that high density residential ought not be. Otherwise we get into an argument about people think that the tsunami zone is everything depicted in the worst case scenario evacuation brochure they see at the fire station. That takes way too much land out of the project. Um, and so an important distinction is what tsunami zone. And I would argue that the one that is commensurate or equal to what's coming out is the 30 to 50 year sea level rise. That seems flooding, sea level rise, tsunamis, where those lines intersect seems like an appropriate geography to me. Yes, Christopher. Well, I just caution that it isn't just the tsunami zone. I understand your concern with it, and it's a big one, and I'm concerned with it too. But there are other aspects of land that will make those lots that were included in the buildable land surveys unsuitable, and those need to be identified as well. I'm not saying not to consider the tsunami or what size of tsunami to consider, but you need also to consider the higher ground that won't be inundated by a tsunami, but is still inappropriate to develop for other reasons. Landslides, for example, or what else? Give me an example. Landslides, definitely, but there may be other reasons, uh, just too steep a ground to be practical, those kind of things. Let's, Fair let's enough, get I agree. a map and a count of actual land that is reasonable to build on as things stand today. I think we will see, you know, between the steepness of the landslides and the hazards in the flats, our geography gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So I think this discussion of boundary adjustments or extreme height reductions it is where we're going. And I think it would behoove us to look at the geographies in town. Look, what comes to mind to me is Lewis and Clark, a transportation corridor largely out of the zone um, not on Highway 30, not on Highway 26. I mean, I think when we look around, the, the, the places that might be migratoriable um, are pretty prescribed. It's not, it's not, not hard to, to identify the potential places that might be better or worse than others. Susanna? Yeah, <clears throat> I would like to add to have an overlay of of available drinking water for development. I think that can be very limiting. And I wish I understood, but I don't, that the development of sewer systems needed to be within an urban growth boundary and a commercial development area, is that correct? That's a question, I guess, for Gail. And if we are to have, I think it was in Chris's comments about other uh, areas of development for um, more high density development in, in rural Patsop County, I think we might need to address that of the development of sewer systems. Thank you. Jan? Yes. Yeah, this is Charles. Um, so I, I just wanted to pipe up and say I'm in total support of the comments made just made by Pat and Chris, um, and also Susanna, for that matter, uh, with respect to uh, making sure that the buildable lands inventory identifies you know, those uh, parcels and portions of land that do have high risk, either from uh, tsunami inundation, from landslides, or from um, 
flooding, because as an example in Cove Beach and Arch Cape, there, there are a number of lots that are in the uh, velocity flood zone uh, that, that are not necessarily suitable for, uh, for development. Uh, so I, I think that is a, a critical part of doing an adequate job of planning for the next 40 years is to address those real factual issues and get those lots out of the buildable inventory so that the expansion can occur in the appropriate places. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Gail, maybe I want to tag on to that. I was just thinking, I know I looked through the the study and and some of the charts that were done. And I it, my mem if my memory serves me correctly, I was amazed that one of them showed uh, Astoria, and I, I did not introduce myself. I'm the vice chair and I live in Astoria uh, of the citizens group vice chair. Um, I, it had something over 3,000 acres of um, vacant land. And to me, that is a stunning number. And I'm wondering, I, it has to include uh, slide zones, uh, hillsides that can't be built on, all sorts of things that, that, uh, that make it really not a viable number. I'm wondering if there is a place where we could, and this, this goes beyond our committee work, but where there is um, the actual data that was used and the maps that were used, because I think some of us could go through and say, oh no, that's not workable, that's not workable, and really come down with um, better understanding. Um, and this really is a, it's a staff task, but um, I suspect we will find that uh, between tsunami areas and unbuildable land, uh, we have smaller uh, footprint than we than the state might think. Um, with, that's been very clear in Astoria right now because we're dealing with a very controversial project that would add uh, lots of workforce housing. And people think we've got places we can build, but they're really not, um, not either available um, or, or they're, you know, they are even in the city. Anyway, is Gail, do you know if the basic data for that study is still accessible? I believe it is still on the county's website. I'd have to search for the link, but it should be there where the housing study is, um, has a is on the web page and the there was a technical advisory committee that did consist of representatives from the incorporated areas and the county who did go through those maps and i remember that astoria's staff and i can't remember if it was rosemary johnson or someone else who was on the committee but um really questioned the amount of land that they were being shown but this was not a formal buildable lands inventory it was just more of a quick and dirty assessment um, of, of the situation and so it did include uh, lands in the tsunami zones the the flood plains the geologic hazard zones and speaking just for the unincorporated parts of the county uh, we don't have any prohibitions that say you can't build there so it didn't seem necessarily logical to say well we can't count that land because we would issue a building permit if somebody came in today and met the requirements. Mm -hmm. um, just to kind of give you an idea of what Clatsop County looks like, um, this includes the tsunami uh, layer. It includes the uh, geologic hazard overlays somewhere, which is all that. And then it, if you show the uh, flood area as well, cool. So the only areas that are outside those three uh, hazard areas would be this gray colored area is what you would be looking at. And almost all that property with the exception of some areas up around Napa and Swenson are primarily gonna be zoned and we can put wetlands on too. That shows you a little bit more. Um, but really most of that, that area is gonna be zoned for forestry. There's just this little bit up here in the Napa Swenson area, a little bit here 
up towards Brownsmead, and then a little bit out um, Highway 202, heading over and a little bit down 53. But um, everything else is forestry. So you would go through a goal exception process with the uh, state to uh, try to explain why you needed to open up resource land to accommodate housing and why housing couldn't be accommodated anywhere else in the county. So. Um, Thank you, Dale. I think it's a big challenge. Excellent. Sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. I just think this is excellent. I mean, this is our reality. I mean, we can kind of bend it for convenience, but um, it's that the flood areas in particular are going to get nothing but bigger over time. If, if there was sea level falling and we could anticipate more land, that would be one sense of motivations. But all things indicate that the lands are going to get smaller and smaller. Um, what is our actual, is it 82% or 84% that is in forestry? Something right up there, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's in the 80s. It's in the 80s. And I would argue that there's no other county in the state of Oregon that has over 80% of their land base in, in forestry. Is that correct? Or that's an, maybe not a question, you know, but. Um, yeah, I, 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 I don't know the answer. I, I have a feeling where Chris might know. Uh, I think Tillamook might be in the same boat i don't know but uh the odf site website i believe shows Clatsop county as 87 percent forest so my point is it's not like um the area we're likely to want to move into would be forest land it's not like we have two percent in production forestry we have an extreme amount more than any other county and i'm laying an argument for why we might kind of propose boundary changes in the areas indicated on this map that are le le least likely to be particularly bad spots. So I've said it before, but given the preponderance of forestry as the resource land, the need because of natural hazards to reduce our footprint or focus our footprint, those certainly provide a basis for an argument, in my opinion. Yeah, uh, this is Jim Allegria. I, I actually completely agree uh, because if you, uh, I have done some uh, uh, review of the uh, statutes and, and they do have a list of priorities. And clearly, if you have an option between non-high productive forestry lands and, and highly productive forestry lands, uh, you know, we should go in the direction of non-resource or low, uh, low valued resource lands. I mean, it's written right there, but it doesn't preclude going into some of the higher lands if you have no other reasonable alternatives. Something like this that uh, Gail has up on the uh, on a screen right now, uh, this may provide uh, the beginning point for a particular policy, not forbidding any building in those areas because you get into some difficult uh, discussions on taking, but at least say that you need to be able to show some kind of mitigation when you do apply for building in these areas, how are you going to mitigate the hazards that's been identified? And so that, that's, that might be a way forward on this without saying a large chunk of the county cannot be built, period. Thank you. Any other comments? Well, it seems to me we we uh, are moving in a an area that that mean that means so, some really strong language or different orientation in terms of how we're talking about housing. I think on the on the urban side of things, what we're seeing because there is a demand to get away from big cities and to come to a beautiful place like ours, uh, we're seeing in the urban areas, we're seeing just astronomical changes in the, in the value of housing. Uh, we're seeing um, a lack of ability to rent when you're sort of doing an entry level job. Um, and we're seeing people wanting to, um, to do short term rentals, those kinds of things that all impact all of our communities. So um, I don't know where to go from there, but I think it means that we need to talk very straightforwardly and honestly about the situation that we find ourselves in um, as an attractive place to move to, but a place that doesn't have a lot of uh, buildable land. 
anyway. Should we, Gail, should we start going through um, the document? And I know that um, Chris has made comments along the margin for, for some of the things that he thinks need to be changed. Do we, do you wanna start in there and just go through? Yeah, we can do that. I know both Chris and Patrick had their hands raised. So I don't oh, I'm sorry. I've had some more comments. Yeah, I, I can't see everybody on my screen. I, the, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not the techie in the family and he's in another meeting. So uh, go ahead then. Chris? Uh, I was just going to say that uh, two, two points. One, you talked about the comments. I submitted written comments. Um, Many of them are minor suggested changes. And, you know, I'm fine with uh, Director Henriksen making the decision as to whether those actually clarify or muddy the picture and to accept or not. But if the, this group wants to go over those uh, comments, that's fine with me. Um, some of the comments, I made were of a more general nature and one which uh, fits in here with our discussion of the last few minutes or 10 minutes has to do with where to go for expansion of population in our county. And to me, it seems pretty obvious that going east is the place to go. And I'm wondering why uh, I didn't see it anywhere in the goal 10 uh, write up uh, discussion of the area around Westport and why that area has uh, not been thought of as a possible area or some sort of uh, urban expansion because I believe they have a sewer system there and maybe a water system and um, the location is is very good for a number of reasons one it's it's closer to a big uh, employer Juana Mills uh, there is forestry land there that's productive and anybody living in a Westport home would have an easier commute to get to their workplace in the eastern part uh, of uh, did, okay um, and and so I I would like maybe to consider later in the conversation today, a policy that actually addresses the idea of taking a serious look at the eastern part of the county for an expanded urbanization, actually turn Westport. I don't know that you need the residents to take it up as far as whether they want to become a city or not, but what are the advantages and disadvantages of being a city and should Westport be a city and should it be expanded uh, to provide housing and greater economic opportunity for the Eastern part of the county and thereby limit the constant flow of motor vehicles through Astoria, Warrington, Seaside going back and forth from home to job and all those kind of considerations. So I'm kind of rambling, but I, I really think we need to take up a serious consideration of uh, the eastern part of the county and it's um, the, the strong points for developing it more. Okay, and I've forgotten who the other person was who uh, had the hand up. I'll follow up on Chris's point. That was great. When you said Westport at first, I'm like, oh my goodness, more traffic on 30. And is that strategic? But your point is that will keep resident populations there if there was a city enough to work in situ, so to speak. Okay. My original question was really just a ping to Gail in our previous conversation. I was reminded of the, am I going to get the acronym right? TFIB project about uh, moving uh, public works and tsunami trails, that, that report by Proaxis maybe. Do you know what I'm talking about, Gail? Oh, the, the TFIF, yeah, parametrics. Yeah, so it has nothing to do with moving public works. Uh, there well, okay, were two, two separate there, projects. <laughs> there are, and in there though, what, what really caught my eye were specific comp plan language that they were suggesting would be appropriate. And I don't know if that report came in after the conversation on goal seven was closed, but 
I would sure hope that those specific comments would be reviewed at least by staff for possible inclusion while we're doing the comp plan update. Um, there were a handful of, of very specific uh, bits of language. Anyway, so that, that's not really a question other than just a, a, a I guess it is a question. Um, is that report something that will be able to play into our goal seven conversation or is goal seven closed at this point? Or was that already incorporated maybe? We incorporated those implementation memo recommendations and the policy language into the draft that went to the Planning Commission on maybe February 8th. Got it. Meeting. Yeah. And some of those may or may not have gotten through. Thank you very much. That answers my question. That was an excellent report, I think. Well spent money. Thank you. Uh, Jan? Yes. This Sorry. is Charles. No yeah. problem. I'm not seeing hands on my computer, so go ahead. Um, so since we're in the overview section, I just wanted to uh, make my comments because uh, I also had a few general comments about goal 10. Uh, the bulk of the contents that I uh, sent around uh, or that Gail sent out for me to all of the members um, kind of focused on um, the impact of short-term rentals on affordable housing in Clatsop County. Uh, I think this is an issue that has been recognized by many, many other jurisdictions. Um, certainly it's been recognized by Astoria, Gearhart, uh, Warrington, uh, Cannon Beach, Beachside, uh, all of whom have implemented uh, various uh, uh, restrictions on short-term rentals. Uh, in Astoria and Warrington, they just prohibited them. And the primary driving force for them seemed to be um, both the impact on the residential neighborhoods as well as the impact on affordable housing. So while we've been talking about where we could expand you know, for future growth, um, I, think, I think in the same, uh, same breath, we ought to recognize that uh, the short-term rental uh, issue is, is in fact exa is exacerbating uh, the, the, the problem with affordable housing because it's taking housing away uh, from long-term rentals and from the availability of affordable housing, as well as driving up the uh, prices of the homes in certain neighborhoods. So that's another avenue that we should uh, explore in, in goal 10 uh, to increase the amount of affordable housing in the county. Thanks. Thank you, Charles. And, uh, and I, I do have that in front of me and you even put in policy language. I think that's, it's this whole, the housing thing is, is a very complicated puzzle and short-term rentals certainly are part of it because they take away um, what might be workforce housing. Yes, go ahead, Jason. You know, I, I hear a lot about short-term rentals and I'm fairly new to the planning commission, but what I'm not new to is building. I've been building for over 20 years in this area and we're constantly doing what we can do to try and find properties available to build houses. That's how we make a living, right? So mm -hmm. we try to find properties or, or areas where we can expand, but the, the driving force in, in houses going up is not all short-term rentals it's all over the nation and it's it's not just the short-term rentals so when i hear that short-term rentals are driving the house prices up you know i just i just went and repriced some houses out that i built four years ago so my building materials from the same exact house i built four years ago 48 months ago are up 400 percent mm -hmm. and then i just built a house last year well about eight months ago and i'm currently building four of the same houses my building materials are up 100% from, from last year. Actually, it's about six months ago. So, and, and they're also, all of the, all of the uh, brokers that are responsible for our building materials, where we get them, how much we get, and they're purchasing and selling to our lumber yards. You know, they're expecting, and they, we just had a huge meeting with all of the top builders that they're, ex they're saying and they're expecting, you know, in the next six months, one to 7% per week. On a seventy thousand dollar package, you know they're going up five six hundred dollars a week, so it, it's it's not that. And then when we ask, okay, what's the problem with this? Their problems are lack of lack of employment. So lack of employment directly relates to supply and demand, and 
a lot of it, you know, some of it is probably price gouging, but they also, they also bring up the fact that interest rates are, are low. I mean, for people to buy a house, I mean, I, I'm at, I'm at 2%. So for people buying houses, it's a lot easier to buy a house right now at two to 3% or even, you know, three and a quarter percent that they couldn't get into at five or 6% a few years ago. So there's a lot of driving forces into why houses are going so fast and they're, they're going so high. It, it's, it, you know, the short-term rental is, is a part of that problem. I agree, but I've, I've lived here. I was born here. I've been here my entire life and I've, I've seen the influx of people and the, the housing. It, it is a, it is a problem. It's a huge problem, but you know, as a builder, I see spots where we could build houses. And I mean, there's a lot of areas on the south end of Seaside. In Gearheart, there's some bigger areas. And we constantly fight zoning problems. Or if you have a little bit of wetlands or a little bit of it's, it's in a designated flood area, there are ways as a builder to build around those things. You know, we can build with second stories, with flood vents on the first floor where it's all garage area. But it makes it so hard, or the way that our county set up makes it so hard for us to do it. A lot of guys are like, forget it. Why would I do it? You know, it's going to have a little added cost, but the, the process is, is a tough one. I mean, there, there's, there's a lot of houses or a lot of areas all over. Lewis and Clark area is a great one that you brought up, uh, Mr. Cochran. Uh, the, the areas in, in, you know, East Westport area, there's a lot of areas. There are a lot of um, uh, natural disaster areas, but those natural disaster areas can be mitigated in the building process and not so much say, hey, you can't build there. It's what can we do to, to build there to make it a little more easy to build for the builders who you know we can build for a lower cost and not have to search ground everywhere else. It's, uh, it's just, it's, those, are, those are some of my thoughts on this thing. You know, it's, it's building materials are high, uh, building costs are high, I can't build what you guys would consider affordable building. I, I just, I can't do it. Um, we try, we try hard. And, and my particular company, I, we build everything in house. We're all from the excavation to the finish work. It's all in house. It's my employees. So I, I keep my costs at a minimum and I still can't compete with what would be called affordable housing. Um, those are just some of my thoughts. You know, if, if anybody has any questions, I'm just into this, but. Anyway, thanks for listening to what I have to say. Thank you, Jason. I think that's that's a very that's a clearly a very big part of what we're dealing with now, and and uh, not one that's in any way that under our control, other than um, than encouraging uh, encouraging local governments to. Um, look at their zoning ordinance for ability to make it a little easier to build. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, and I used to be a planner, so that kind of, you know, um, that's, that's uh, it's a very different thing from what, what I did when I was working, but we really need to uh, attack, I think, from every, every piece of the puzzle that we're able to, in order to have a place where, um, your children, my grandchildren could actually ever own a house because uh, we're really getting out of that territory these days. Uh, anybody else want to add to the discussion right now? Uh, I'd, I'd like to chime in here, this Chris Ferrar. Yes, Chris. Um, I appreciate uh, the very helpful perspective that uh, our relatively new commissioner, uh, Kretsch, uh, has just laid out there and I, I understand that issue about the cost and it's something that I've harped on in the city council meetings and at the county level that um, the affordability of houses what needs to be addressed is the low wage rate that on the average uh, working people in this county have there are some good paying jobs and those people can afford the homes 
at the price that it costs to build them these days. But you can't just try to build something inexpensive enough that somebody with an outdated uh, pay scale can afford. And so it's, it, it's very difficult to handle this problem just starting at one end or the other end and, and trying to make it work. You, you need better paying jobs for people to ever catch up and be able to afford the cost of a house as it is today, or you need a way of granting them some public money to help them do that. But those are, those are different questions than straight housing. The one thing I will say about um, the lots that are buildable or not, uh, these areas that uh, the county has that are in hazard zones, sure, you can design structures to, in some cases, uh, be built in those areas and survive but that adds a huge cost to it. And there's no point in being unrealistic about what happens when a tsunami or a flood happens. Damage is done. And um, even if the structure survives, maybe the whole neighborhood around it doesn't. And so what good is a house in a situation like that? So to try to look at both sides of this, I, I think there has to be some consideration given uh, to the idea of land exchanges. Find the good lots. Again, it goes back to what's a good buildable lot. Figure out if some of that's county land, maybe it can be exchanged for private lands that are in unfavorable zones to build or zones that would just be very cost prohibitive to build a structure in and exchange the land. Have our open spaces, our parks, in the places that flood, keep the wetlands, they're important. Wetlands provide important uh, ecological functions that preserve the quality of our waters, which are important to our fisheries. And a lot of people depend on fishery here. So you can't disconnect these things. I think we need to work with builders, property owners, and county land and make exchanges that make land available for residential development. But as to the cost, we're stuck in a world global market and there's not much we can do to make cheap houses. I follow up on that, Jan? Uh, well, Cheryl's had her hand up. Oh, go I ahead, Cheryl. Yeah, sorry. And then you, Chris, I mean, Pat, go ahead, Cheryl. This sort of big picture discussion that we've been having is, is really excellent. And I think these are all issues that we need to get on the table and for all of us to share information from different perspectives and sort of start from a place of knowledge. Um, <laughs> so <I> would... <laughs> sorry. That must be yours, Jan. That's yes. not mine. <laughs> I'm a year uh, old however... quarter college, sorry. <laughs> however, I would remind us that it is not our responsibility to solve the housing crisis in Clatsop County. Um, if it did, this discussion would have to continue for the next week, the next year. Um, I would remind us that we're an hour into our meeting now. Um, and while the big picture discussion is excellent and I've learned a lot, um, I would suggest that we move to our responsibility, which is to uh, look at land use planning. And I'm ready to go to the overview and as we usually do to move smoothly through that, um, quickly through that, and then we can look at uh, policies if there's anything we wanna add or anything we wanna change. Thank you, Cheryl. That was my next statement, but Pat, you have something to say first. Do we have a chat function here? I don't see chat anywhere. No, I don't either. Okay, well, I will bring this real to a close because I agree with Cheryl. Um, just following up on Commissioner Kraushar's point um, uh, in the hazard zones, I would, I would be fine with um, transportation, warehousing, and commercial uh, developments in that zone, just not residential. Th that's just a statement. The question, I guess, uh, to Jason is, um, outside of like hazard designations, is there some county comp plan 
code that gives you undo headache that you would like to undo? Um, is there sort of a something that you keep coming around to that we can use some language to help or you would have brought that up by now, I guess. There are there are a few, you know, one of them is anything that's in the flood zone. We have to we have to rely on uh, a FEMA, the model from FEMA. That's I, I mean, I'm, I'm working on one particular uh, piece of property and, and that I'm speaking of as well. I've been trying to do this for six years and I cannot get FEMA to even acknowledge me to work with me or anything. I have sent hundreds of emails and phone calls and everything. In that, I mean, that's just one particular area and it's an area in this county that is in the flood zone, but it has never in my lifetime flooded. And I, I mean, I, if I mentioned it, everybody here would be like, oh, okay, I know that one. When the entire county is underwater, that's where everybody parks. So there, there's areas that, that are buildable and, and we brought up, you know, the areas, uh, I think you brought up the, the Seaside School District properties, the Gearhart, the, the Seaside High School, you know, there's houses all around they're, we're not going to mitigate the rest of the housing around them. And in building in Oregon, in, in Seaside in particular, anything that is on the west side of the highway has to be engineered. So we have to, we have to, you know, employ an engineer to draw up our plans or to engineer our plans. And I, I'm, I'm building four houses that I just said that were, that I built a couple of years ago, uh, the similar house and the engineering on this one compared to an area where it wasn't engineered is probably, I think there's, um, I don't know if anybody knows what a hold down is, but it's a great big piece of rebar that goes in to the concrete. I'm building close to the ocean in Seaside. There's 12 hold downs in this house. And in the last house I built that was in Eastern or East of Gearhart, there was two. So it, it's, it's the, the requirements for us to build in these areas. I would like to call them as a builder and I tear down several houses. I have an excavator. They're the ones that are almost impossible to tear down. Now, if if we're worried about flooding, there's there's ways around flooding. You know, there's flood vents in non-livable um, areas in the basements. We've we've built those as well, where it's all garage on the first floor or storage. Instead of just saying no, I think that there's areas that we could build. Um, I mean, those areas that I'm talking about that we brought up were the Seaside School District properties. They're in city limits. They're going to do what they want to do. They're they're that's their own, not our problem. But there's there's ways around building in an inundation zone. Is a tsunami going to happen? Probably. Is it is it going to be in our lifetimes? Who knows? We 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 don't know this. If we did, we would have a whole. If we could predict all this stuff, we would be we would be a lot further ahead than we are. So it's to me, it's something that's inevitable. It's not going to stop people from moving here. It's not going to stop people from wanting to be closer to the ocean, closer to the, the city limits, um, whether, you know, like a person like me, I would love to be up in Lewis and Clark. I've been looking for property up there for 10 years to try and find something to buy. All of the property that's up there is, is uh, EFU or forestry, and it's impossible to, to build up there unless you have 80 plus acres. You know, I, I know personally that if we had properties up there available to build instead of being like 80 acre minimums, 40 acre minimums, 30 acre minimums, you would have an influx of, of housing available. And we talk about septic systems, septic systems, if you study them, they, they are, they're not bad. If they're done right, if they're built right, if they're, they're do it, you know, all of the drainage systems, they work. Now, cesspools and stuff that they did back in the olden days, those are just big old pools of waste. That, that is not what I'm talking about. Those are disgusting. They need to be mitigated. I know that Gearhart's taken a big step in getting rid of all of those, but and and then the water availability that that's a that's an issue I see. I know that everywhere I've I've tried to build, there is water available for you know uh, to dig a uh, a well or or have a well drilled. It's available now. If if we got 500 houses on a well, say in Lewis and Clark, that might take away from that availability. I don't know, but. Uh, it, it's something so simple as it, it, we're not going to solve the water crisis. It's, it's, it's something that the cities and the county level is going to have to do because I, if I'm understanding right, I think the city of Warrington, which provides water to where I'm at out in the unincorporated area, they're on a moratorium for water right now, unless it's changed recently. But I, I believe that all of the properties out here 
can't get a, a water meter because they're concentrating on their they're in town, they're, they're incorporated areas. Um, I could be wrong, but I know we were going through that a little bit ago, but th there's, there's a lot bigger problem than just a housing crisis. And, and, and I, I'm here to talk through it with everybody too. If we can come up with some. <clears throat> Thank you, Jason. Good things. Thank you. Okay. Is there anybody else who wants to speak before we um, actually go start through the document? Yes, Susanna. Well, some of it is <clears throat> document related. Um, so can I just make some comments on the document? Well, and could then you, I do. Could you make them? I do have. I'm just wondering if it might be more helpful if we start in and you make them as they come up. Okay. That way we I can just. Uh, yeah, go one ahead. Comment though, overall, is. I, I wish um, there could be more discussion on ADUs, auxiliary dwelling units, and a cluster development today. I'm sure we'll get there. That might help. Thank you. Thank you. So Gail, um, I, I sort of lean toward uh, uh, Christopher's comments that that he would trust you with most of the changes he su suggested. Um, I, uh, but we do need to go through, I think, just, just go through as there are, um, as a, the bulk of the document and it be, before we get to the objectives and policies, I tend to want to go there, but let's, uh, let's briefly go through um, the narrative and see if people have anything else they want to add. Does anybody have something in the overview that they would like uh, added or changed? Yes. Uh, what, what page is that? Oh, let's see. Um, I have to. It's uh, page one in our print section. Yeah. And Jim, was okay. it you, you who wanted to add a comment? Yes, go ahead. Uh, yes, on page two of the overview, second paragraph that begins with between 1970 and 1980, that paragraph and the lower half has, as well as by environmental protections enacted in 1980, 1990. My suggestion is to delete the enacted and insert uh, and technological advancements. So in other words, it would read uh, for the whole sentence, overall growth rates during this period may have been influenced by national recessions in the 1970s and 1980s, as well as by environmental protection and technological advancements uh, the uh, in the 1980s and 1990s, and I'm going to continue um, impacting. Let's see. Uh, impacting employment in the wood product industries. Period. So, in other words, expanding instead of just logging operation would be the wood product industries. So, those two changes would would acknowledge the fact that uh, environmental protections as well as advancements in technology in the wood product industry, and also broadening the logging uh, operations to include uh, the wood product industry. Uh, thank you so much. That was, uh, that, that was helpful. Um, is there any um, opposite? Charles, whoops. Okay, Chris, you have to add to that. I, I'll just say that I'm fine with that wording. I, I had a comment uh, that I provided in my written comments that addressed that uh, particular group of sentences there, but I'm, I'm fine with Jim's wording. In fact, I think it's a little better than what I had uh, submitted. Is there um, anyone, I will just say, is there anyone who objects to including that uh, change in the uh, narrative. Uh, what one, excuse me, uh, I, I would, uh, my suggestion would be to 
uh, delete logging operations and the wood product industry as a substitution for the wood, uh, logging operations because it includes that. Yeah, I, un I understood that. Oh, okay. Well, but, I, I was no, just good for catching that. Thank you. Okay, good. Thank you, Gail. Is there anyone who objects to that addition? Hearing none, we'll just move ahead then with that. Thank you. Well, um, I'd just say at this point, since I had a comment about the second, the next sentence in that paragraph, okay. um, I, I, I kind of hate to have to go through all the written comments I made by point, yeah. but I understand they came late. People had little chance to read them. But on that second sentence, I added something, and I'm going to paraphrase here because I don't remember exactly what I submitted in my written comment. But um, I was going to add the fact that um, one of the reasons the fishing industry has been hard hit, other reasons include a decline in anadromous fish from the dams on the rivers, uh, pollution, and overfishing. So, you know, I think those points need to be in there. And this isn't to hammer away at anybody in particular or any problem in particular, but I think it's important that in this document, we provide enough background so that people, as they address planning issues, are aware of some of the factors that influ influence other aspects of, of land use. And if you don't have those, if you don't recognize those and deal with them, then the choices you make may not be uh, very good ones for the county residents. So it isn't to point fingers at anybody. It isn't to say, oh, we've been dirty people and polluted our ground. It's to recognize that the fish are disappearing for a lot of reasons. Mm -hmm. Uh, Go ahead. I mean, that statement does seem to be particularly pointed at the Gilnet fishery um, decision that was that happened right around that time. That's a very specific. I mean, we could either just be very general, which would be my preference, or like there's the five H's, habitat, hydro, hubris. What are the other H's? I mean, there's a there are known causes that could just be referred to, but this is a particular issue that was more of a political statement, and I just assume see it gleaned even if I agree with it or not. Uh, and I'd like to add, can I ahead, add a Go ahead, Susanna. That, um, just the climate warming has made the, for spawning beds and for the environment, it's the, the little fishes to survive the warming waters has been very difficult lately. And I think so warming climate should be included. Well, so what I'm what I'm hearing um, is that to make that more of a statement that is more general statement, um, less not just gill, the use of gill nets, but um, climate, the changes in climate, the um, impacts on streams, I mean, the, all the other things that in fact um, have affected the, the fishery industry. Yes, I think Chris's comment saying warming oceans and warming climate, I would just add warming climate on his comment would be perfect. Yes, go ahead, Gail. Yeah, so just to kind of maybe refocus us a little bit, um, this is just kind of an introductory narrative to goal 10, which deals with housing. I'm a little concerned that we're starting to become goal nine, which is economic development and providing the whole history of the fishery industry, and uh, which is probably more appropriate for goal nine than perhaps goal 10. Um, I, I, I would, recommend that maybe we go to a more general type of language or just remove it altogether because um, I don't want to get too far in the weeds on the woes of the fishing industry. Well taken, well taken. Um, 
I'm I'm of the opinion that, that we can leave it to staff to uh, make that a more generalized comment on what has happened with the fishing industry. Anybody else agree? Okay, I've got some. I agree. Okay, uh, anybody object to that? Okay, let's move on and so we can get through to this. We, we uh, it is 10, 18 or so, so we want to keep moving. Okay. So Jan? Yes? Uh, just for what it's worth, I, I noticed Nadia is not here, but she did uh, submit uh, some written comments that included comments on the overview. So, and I, I certainly agreed with everything that Nadia uh, had recommended in terms of changes. So um, hopefully uh, either the, the group will agree that we can include Nadia's comments or the staff will include Nadia's comments or, or somebody will will help make sure that those comments get recognized in the document. Yes, Thanks. good comment. And uh, I would, I would, if that's a motion, I'm kind of seconding, I guess I'm seconding it and saying that again, uh, there's four or five uh, people that submitted written comments and some of them are around the same point. And so it might be more efficient and I hate to lay work on director Henriksen but it might be more efficient for her to look through them and try to resolve minor differences and to use her own judgment about what improves the background materials on this goal. And I would be very comfortable with her pursuing that effort or, or her, her, her staff as well. We have, well, we have, I, I agree and I supported, I found that, um, Nadia's comments were very helpful. Um, we has, we sort of have a um, a motion, uh, if if you will agree to that, and a second uh, asking staff to incorporate uh, the comments um, made by Chair Gardner. Um, what do we? Have? I second it. Okay. Uh, all in, it was moved and seconded um, that those comments be incorporated by staff. Um, all those in favor? Can we can we have a little discussion, please? Sure. I'm sorry. Thank sorry. You. No, my apologies. No, no, no. This is my first time sharing in this on. Uh, uh, no, I, I mean I'm I'm in agreement on most of Nadia's comments, but she does incorporate some new policies, and I don't think we ought to just blanketly approve those. I think at the point in time when we get to this adding a policy in or adding a policy out that we ought to talk about them. And that's my only comment at this point in time. As far as the editorial stuff, other than I'm curious about sources on some of the things she adds, uh, yeah, we can move forward. I, but I would really like to talk about the policies. Yes, I, I agree with you. Um, and uh, yes, Cheryl? No, this is Charles. Um, so it, it, my, my motion had to do with Nadia's comments in the overview section. And, and I absolutely okay. agree with the, the last speaker that, that her specific motions on policies and goals, we will tackle that when we get to them. But uh, my motion really was about the overview section. Thanks. Okay, thank you. And now Cheryl, You're, you had your hand up. Yes. I I agree with what was previously said. I agree with Mr. Powers that, um, yeah, to just clarify the motion that what we're accepting are Nadia's comments in sort of the background narrative, but I agree wholeheartedly that we should look at um, adding to the policies one at a time as we get there. Yeah, and, and anything that would help us um, move through the narrative and begin to do the hard work of looking specifically at the policies, that would be great. I hear you. Well, uh, shall we go ahead and vote on the on adding narrative changes from uh, from uh, Chair Gardner, since we have that on the floor. Aye. All those in favor, um, 
Well, I can't see you all, but all those in favor say aye. 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 And all those opposed? Okay, then it carries. I'll try to do better next time around. Um, thank you. So let's go ahead and see if we can't get through the narrative so we can get to the policies. Uh, Jan, I just have a quick question for clarification. Yes. So uh, was the motion only for Commissioner Gardner's comments or for all the written comments that were uh, provided? Every, the only, per, what I heard was Commissioner Gardner's. And, and we do need to deal with the others. That's, that's what I heard too, but I, I move that we make a similar uh, operational decision to have uh, county planning staff review the comments on the narrative section, the overview section, and use their judgment about what helps to clarify and what is is uh, pertinent to include in that section that supports the policies that are uh, given at the end of the document and make it for all four or five people that submitted. Is there a second? Second. Okay, again, why don't we, um, why don't I actually call people's names and, and we have a vote. Uh, Jim Allegria? Aye. Cheryl Johnson? Aye. Charles Dice? Aye. Na, uh, Chris Farrar? Aye. Jason Krashar? Aye. Oh, aye, okay. Uh, Clyde Powers? Aye. Lam Kwang? Aye. Uh, have I missed anybody? Uh, Pat Corcoran is I. Pat Corcoran, you're on my list. Pat Corcoran? <laughs> aye. Susanna, uh, aye. Susanna, aye. Thank you. Well, that sounds to me like um, we have a strong affirmative vote there. So that passes. And let's go on and see if we can, um, if we can get through this and get to the policies. Um, let's give ourselves you know, give ourselves five minutes or so to go through the narrative. Does anybody need a break right now, by the way? Nope. Okay, let's go ahead. I just, I need to say that uh, about 12, 1230, I will need to, to leave. I okay. have a, I have a baseball game that just got switched and I'm the coach. So I have to be there at one o'clock or play at one o'clock. So that's um, an honorable reason. <laughs> it's it's uh, spring break. Lots of games this week. Yeah. Okay, let's go ahead then, Gail. I guess if anybody has any changes they want to make to the overview section. I got, I got, a, I got a question on page six. I just don't know if that's the overview section or later on. Sorry. That's Charles. Clark. Charles speaking. No, Clark. Okay. I for him. I, I can't say him. Speak. What do? What would you like to add? Uh, have changed? Well, oh, no. I had a question on. I I guess uh, it's on page six. I guess of the overview. Is that where it where it has charts, uh, tables six, seven, and eight? Yes, it talks about percents of income. And I was looking for percents of what? What's it a percent of? I just couldn't find anything that would tell me that, but maybe I just missed it. It's 120% of what? Is, is of that... median family income for the county yeah. uh, so area. Is there a baseline for median family income? It... 50,000, 40,000? Or is it just a? Just yeah, a there is. It wasn't included in the tables from the regional housing needs analysis, but we can uh, see if we can find that information that they use. Yeah, it's just a clarification. It's just a net. But I was just trying to figure out where. Thank you. 
Yeah, and that changes from year to year, but um, there, I know the information is out there. I don't know. I was just looking at a lot of, a lot of people uh, uh, in uh, one particular table had a lot of houses and they were in the 120% of something. And I was thinking, wow, the demographics of the county have really changed. They are. Yeah. Uh, Susanna, you had a question? Susanna? Yes. Uh, I often, I like the term workforce housing because it is based more on a minimum wage, which is the predominant wage in workforce housing. And, and I'm not always sure the medium family income, what does that cover? And yes, and it should be stated what that is. Thank, thank you. Yes. Okay. But then I, I guess I can then my other, that's page 10, I think. And I had a note as for page 10 um, as to what is vacant. I just, that's my note, but I don't see. Um, oh, I'm sorry, that's page six. Okay. And I found this to be. Um, this didn't make sense to me at all. I, in that I see Warrington as a place which is sometimes a lower rent area, no aspirations, but just afford, let's say affordable and to have a huge predominant vacant makes no sense. And then in Cannon Beach, I've, maybe it's possible capacity to build. Suzanne, that, could, I inter could I interrupt you just to say yes. this? This is a chart from another document. So really, we really can't change it. Yes, that's true. Um, and I've had questions about this too. This is when I, I said, you know, um, cap unit capacity, uh, it, it's, a, it's confusing at least, but at, yes. the, if we're incorporating from another study, I don't know that we can fiddle with that too much. Yes. Other comments? Yes, Jim. Um, I uh, like the term medium family income, and I actually do not like the term workforce housing since it doesn't have a definition. Uh, so that's one comment. The second comment is I, I understand that it is a bit confusing, like the, the graph that's up there. My suggestion would be to ask the staff to uh, provide a little clarification of what the, what the graphs actually mean, uh, but keep the graphs the same. So as long as we understand what it's trying to say, then uh, you don't have to touch anything. Good comment. Thank you. I would agree. And then another comment that could be clarified is on um, page 12, the where, which I think this is important of where people are living, the circles also don't make sense to me. Um, I think that fact that in Warrington, they work outside the city. I think they're going to Astoria to work. That's probably. And I think it's, and I think it's important information to have in planning. But this graph didn't help me at all. Certainly got my attention. Uh, Cheryl. Cheryl, go I ahead. Had, I had a. a question for Gail and then just one comment. Um, Gail, somebody asked earlier, but is it possible for us to do um, comments on the side? In, in the past, we've used that as a tool to help us be more efficient. Sometimes we type in um, motions 
and then we sort of get to draft them and then look at them and it yeah. in the past we've used that as a nice tool i just didn't see it available today the chat function yeah chat. there is a chat function on zoom i think with our security settings we may have switched it off and i've been trying to figure out a way to turn it back on um but i don't want to accidentally <laughs> end the meeting uh, right for everyone okay. while i'm doing that so i have been trying but i i don't know enough cheryl to to fix the problem right now okie dokie thank you um, and Jan, my, I just had a quick comment on page 13 under current conditions. Um, I don't know if we're ready to move to current conditions yet. I, I had a comment about this figure. Okay, if, you want to go ahead, Chris? You want to go, go in order here. Uh, I've, I found this figure actually very helpful, although slightly limited. I think this figure should stay in. Uh, it provides a lot of important information. I did, I think in my written comments, suggest that it would be great if we can include an additional figure or a modification of this figure that did give an indication of where the people, which direction they went to get to work from those locations, because it would tell you something about where housing might be more appropriate to put it, or, and also things to do with our transportation network. But I wrote that in my written comments, and I won't say anything further on it, but I recommend leaving figure five in. It's very helpful. I would just add that I, I think to do that kind of study is, uh, is, a, is a bit beyond what our capacities are right now, but I found it very interesting because it also, I think also tells us something about the cost of housing in the places that are there and that people really are having to live in one place and drive to another because, because of what's happening with uh, housing prices and with, with uh, rentals. But I, you know, it, to th do that kind of a study is, is I think pretty intensive. It sure points to the regionality of our lifestyles. I mean, we live and work all over the place and that's kind of, I think one of the points here in addition to just causes, is that we're a regional population. Yes, I agree. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes, Clark. Yeah, I was just going to say, yeah, when I saw this, I was really surprised. But again, that's nothing new for me, is most of the people work outside the city where they reside, which is a migration pattern, which impacts not only transportation, but housing. Yeah, this figure should stay in. That's my viewpoint. Okay, can we move from there? Okay. Uh, I do have uh, actually more of a question than a comment on this graph. Uh, there is obviously a large proportion of the residents working outside the city, but does that include uh, people who telework? If so, then it's a little misleading. I think what we're looking at are people who physically uh, drive to another spot uh, like, like I, I don't work in the city, but I certainly don't commute. Yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know the background of the graph. I assume I, I can add, I can add just personal six of the last 10 homes I've built and sold are people that moved here because they can now work remotely and they are working at Intel, Nike, and a couple other places in Portland. And they're, they're living here full time, but they are not working here in our county. And that's six of the last 10 houses I've built. And uh, my wife, who's a realtor, would tell me the same thing that a lot of her people that are buying houses here are, are buying because they can work remotely. Yes, that's, 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 my, uh, that's my concern about the graph. And I don't know the answer to it in terms of what actually is in there. I, 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 this is Jan, I, so I sort of, I doubt that they included that in, in this study because I, I don't know how they would have gone about it, but I, I will say in my neighborhood, um, two houses have, and it's very, it's a very, it's not, it's not a posh neighborhood at all, but two houses in the last six months have sold for over half a million and they're both people who are re working remotely. 
moving along. Is there any comments beyond uh, page 12? <clears throat> I, I take it that we will leave this chart in and uh, Gail, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, we'll leave the chart in. I'll try to provide as much clarification as I can regarding telecommuters and um, the other information. But I, again, uh, this is a graph and a graphic that came from our 2019 housing strategies report. So um, I'm not able to go back and alter the work of the consultants who did it, uh, but I can try to explain as much as I can if I can find that information. But I agree with Jan, I don't think it included telecommuters. Yeah, I think that's happened in the last, <clears throat> in the last two years, more or less. Okay. Um, anybody else have comments that they want to add? Move, shall we move from, um, from this uh, section on there? So that's basically explanation of uh, what the agencies are who are involved in housing. I thought that helpful. Yes, Cheryl. I just wanted to make a comment here on, so current conditions, um, page 13, they start out by talking about NOAA and, and the role of NOAA, and then nicely clearly list the three that are supported by NOAA in our county. And overall, I thought that the background information in this one I thought the staff did an excellent job of bringing us information and as current as possible of information for us to try and make decisions and move forward. Um, the, the one that was interesting to me is that it, where it says um, the website states that the waiting list for housing choice voucher is approximately three years. That was amazing to me. We as people who are working on the comprehensive land use plan can't do anything about that but it's certainly something for us to keep in mind that when they're talking about that their that their you know mission is to break the poverty cycle when people have to wait 3 years for what's available that's amazing uh, this is Jan and my would just say my life experience uh, working as a casa at one point a, a a child advocate in the court system uh, i know that 10 years ago, it was two years. So it's, uh, it's and, and we all know that having a place to go home to is sort of what, what makes us able to function. And so it's, it's really a, a serious issue. Thank you, go ahead. I do want to say, this is Gail, um, I think, Chris, you had asked for us to find the number of residents for each apartment complex. I don't know if we can do that, but would you be satisfied if we uh, were to list the number of units? Yes, just, just something to give me an idea there of the capacities. Of those, of those particular units, those bit, Alder Court, et cetera? Correct. Okay, thank you. Yeah. yeah, that would be interesting. Okay, Jan, I think Cheryl has her hand up. Well, oh, I'm sorry. Yes, Cheryl? Still under current conditions um, on page 17, if we're able and willing to um, move ahead to that, uh, failing septic systems. Are we okay to go there, Jan? Yes, yes, I, th I think a lot of the, the other was descriptive. Go ahead. Okay. In the third paragraph down, um, it says, these operational changes have required septic haulers to utilize facilities outside of Clatsop County. 
And because I was on the CAC <clears throat> for the Northeast, and as in our early discussion today, one of the things that we looked at was increasing the possibilities for affordable housing and or workforce housing in the Napa Swenson area out here in, in the Northeast area. This issue of septic systems is a really important one and whether or not there are sewer systems and, and they seem to drive whether or not you can build and how much you can build and where you can build. And I would just say that uh, last week uh, we had our septic system uh, pumped out and it cost $500 because the local business who does it now has to haul to Rainier. There isn't anything in Clatsop County where he can go and dump. So the price on that obviously you know, has gone up over the years and the availability of this. So it is an underlying issue in whether or not we can build and where we can build. Yes. And it's, um, you know, they're depending upon where in the county and the soil types and so on, it, it's, it's um, a serious issue for us to address. Uh, I would notice that uh, Chris also had some comments on the same page that I guess uh, that uh, staff can catch. Anybody else and want to? I would, Susanna? Yeah, yes. <clears throat> I'd like to um, <clears throat> add um, the possibility that we could have in cluster development to share a drain field. I think the big cost of a, a sewer system, a septic system is the drain field. I don't think the individual septic tanks are that, or back in the day were that expensive. And so I think to have increased housing sharing a drain field and a cluster development would be possibly really helpful, especially if we could change some zoning, um, like uh, the RA5 in the country to be RA1 with cluster development possibly. Well, I think I'm guessing that pr pretty much is something that we ought to deal with in a policy statement. Don't you yes. think? Yeah, so why don't we um, put it there? I'm gonna give, oh, Jason, I see that you have, do you have your hand up? I, I was just gonna address the septic systems. You know, it, it, if you do a cluster development, let's take the reserve. That's the largest one in this county, I think, of, as far as a cl cluster type development that uses a septic sewer system. And every house has its own tank, so you, you're not gonna eliminate that. And then the drain field is gigantic. So you take what would be a small drain field for each residence, and you, you, you make that into a larger area. All it does is it, it, it keeps it more controlled into one area instead of spread out sporadically. And now all that's, you know, that's usage. That's, that's how many people are going to be in the, the houses, you know, con uh, compared to how many bedrooms and whatnot. So there are other options for septic systems. I, I'm a septic in a certified septic installer as well. And I've went through the classes and all. there are different systems instead of just saying, hey, we can't do a septic system. There's pod systems. They're, they are a little bit more expensive. And yeah, the, the cost of dumping is going up. But if you take that, you know, it's recommended, you know, every two to five years depends on how many people live in your home. So if you divide a, a $500 cost over five years or, or two to three years, it, it, it kind of divides itself out. Uh, I have a septic system as well, and I pay for those dumping fees, which I've heard the guys from the septic system companies that, that dump them, you know, costs are going up and I don't know why we're not allowed to dump in the area. The um, Seaside has a sewer system, Warrington, Astoria, but there are ways, maybe incentives to, uh, to have alternative dumping sites. There's, there's burning facilities. There's all sorts of stuff that we could maybe incentivize somebody to come in the area to do things like that. And the I, county is looking at um, 
the feasibility of an anaerobic biodigester that would uh, help to address some of these issues, especially if it could take some of the uh, septage that's coming from like the breweries and things that otherwise would get dumped into the regular sewer systems. And so uh, I don't know when that study is going to be completed, but they have been looking at that. Yeah, it, it's, it is a problem for Astoria, I know. Yes, and I, I really like a lot of the comments that uh, Commissioner uh, Krauschar <laughs> made about septic systems and uh, to the extent that uh, a drain field can be made uh, uh, to serve several homes rather than have them distributed all over the place really has benefits to the groundwater. And um, I, I think that when we get to the policy section, which I hope is quickly, uh, we might entertain trying to put something together to that effect that uh, we explore more flexible ways of handling our sewage and, and all these kinds of needs that we, we may have. And I see uh, Commissioner Lamb has had his hand up electronically for a while. Sorry, I can't see him. Uh, oh. Commissioner Lamb. Yeah. Yes, um, I think this is on the same note. I have looked into the uh, whole biodigester of the, uh, the septic system, and the um, there are proven systems that work very well and very small uh, part of it, it and it uh, completely digests all the sewage from a house to be used as fertilizer. And it seemed to work very well. And I hope that's part of what the county is uh, looking into for each individual uh, system of, of homes, because that's, and I think that would solve a lot of problems that we have as a as, um, demand for, for, for housings. Well, maybe we can find language for that when we get to our policies. I'm going to suggest that we um, that we take that we take a five minute break before we deal with climate change, and then we come back and uh, see how if we can get through uh, the policies before we break for lunch, maybe at twelve thirty or something. Does that make sense to anybody? Sounds good. Okay, thank you. To begin, we can begin the meeting again. Um, I suspect we were we were past. I think we were sort of had done dealt with septic tank systems. Uh, is there anything else that anyone wants to add to that discussion? I see a hand. Is that Lam? Did you want to add anything? No, you're just moving stuff around. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, I saw your hand. I think, yeah. <laughs> I think it's, I think my hand is down. Yes, it is down. Yeah. Okay, okay shall we go ahead with a discussion um, to climate change? By the way, I thought this was quite a good, um, good, good staff work here. And Jan? Yes? And so I blipped out just before our break. And so we've okay. concluded housing. I believe we've, I believe we've, we've, no, we haven't concluded housing. We are, we, but we are, uh, we have been, we've concluded discussion of septic tank systems. Got it. Very moving good, thank you. To, yeah, moving to um, climate change and its its impact on on housing. And I would note that uh, Charles, I mean, Chris had some comments that he wanted added there. Yeah, those those were part of my package deal that okay. we discussed so we earlier have, we've dealt with that are but there, if there are specific ones that somebody wants to discuss or has a problem with including they could make that kind of discussion now 
I didn't I didn't see anything there. What what about anyone else? Hearing nothing, I, I, I suggest that we then accept uh, staff's writing on climate change and its impact on, on housing. Um, the only thing, you know, in big picture, it, Converting climate change into sea level rise and flooding, uh, there will be less and less buildable land through time given climate change. I don't know if that's appropriate here and hazards. It's, it's also yeah. Looking at the code, it just I didn't see one being used. I thought we could use it, but it's your power. I'm done. Who who was that? Who was coming? I think Charles had a little uh, crossover. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think maybe we can move on to um, actually to the housing, I mean, to the policy questions. Does that seem appropriate to you, Gail? Yep, I think that would be very appropriate, Jan. Okay. Chris has his hand up. Okay. Chris. I had a suggestion uh, for policy A to uh, retain policy A, but to add at the end of that sentence the words, but balance with carrying capacity. Thank you. Is there any objection to adding that? Hearing none, let's leave it as uh, as as altered. Can I come in? Of course, go ahead, Susanna. And by surface areas, I ima I imagine meaning water and sewage. Uh, perhaps that should be spelled out. And I think some of our earlier discussion might lead to establishing more service areas. Well, uh, because so we need. Which, I would just which, add the which policy. Which policy are you referring to? It'd be helpful if you. Policy A, because right now with the earlier discussion, there's a lot of population in hazardous zones. And if we want to move people out of hazardous zones, I think we need to look at what, uh, just to look at service, what is service areas and could we establish another service area? Okay, so I want to address that, that question. Ability. Yes, Gail, go yeah, ahead. Before we go too far down this path. Uh -huh. So goal 11 and the implementing uh, OAR, the Oregon Administrative Rules, is very specific and very um, restrictive on how and when and if counties and, and unincorporated areas can expand water and sewer services. So for sewer services, there is basically no provision that would allow the county to create or extend or expand sewer services to unincorporated rural parts of the county unless we are addressing some sort of health emergency. So if everybody's septic tanks out in Evergreen Acres fails at one time, um, you know, that might be a situation where the county might be able to get authorization to put in uh, a sewer system, but we could not then use that sewer system 
to uh, suddenly expand and incorporate or create a rural community there. So it would be very limited. Same thing with the water is, you know, a lot of our unincorporated areas do have water districts, but we cannot use the fact that there's a water district to um, as the basis for increasing density. So we have to keep in mind that um, goals 11 and 14 are really meant to funnel denser, more intense development into urban growth boundary areas and to really protect the rural lands. So we're gonna be very, very limited. So I don't want to put in a policy that is basically gonna go against either goal 14 or goal 11. So just. So there are boundaries there. Very, yeah, very I, strong I would, ones. I would just add that service, once you're getting into urban uh, development, deals with police and fire and those kinds of things too. So you're not just dealing with water and sewer or septic tank systems. There then becomes a demand for other things. Yes, Cheryl. Uh, just a quick question to Gail, just for my understanding. So this rule that there can be no new sewers to expand into rural, um, whose rule is that? Where is that? How is that enforced? I'm sure you said that, I just didn't get it's, it. I didn't give you the exact citation, but if you can hold on a second here, I can probably find oh, it's it. Okay. It's, it's Oregon Administrative Rules and um, it's part of goal 11. And if you give me a minute, I will find it for you. And actually that that's close enough that, so that it's, it's Oregon Administrative Rules and that it's in there. Okie dokie. I find that a major impediment to doing what we would like to do in the Northeast, which is to use some, some of our rural lands for duplexes and, and triplexes, but we can't do that if there isn't any sewers and then there's a rule against making new sewers. So <laughs> I would just needed to be clear on where that rule was coming from. Thank you. Yeah, it's uh, OAR 660-011, public facilities planning. And Cheryl, you really put your finger on it. I mean, everything that we've kind of talked about doing goes up against that. The whole, you know, as you know, the whole po point of the planning is to concentrate in the urban growth boundaries. And in our rural community I, with our hazards and our others, I think we're really seeing that is the problem. And so I think, uh, you know, that and it's the hard work of making changes for those uses to occur. Um, because you're right, everything is connected. All of a sudden it's transportation, police and fire. It's like, we, we want the good stuff just to have nice houses in the woods, but we don't want to have police and fire and sanitation and everything else that goes with it. There's really like a tipping point uh, that we're up against right now. Yeah. I would just add to that, um, as a planner long ago, when I was a planner, I uh, argued against locating uh, lots of houses in the, in the uh, foothills um, forests of California. And, um, you know, we've seen what has happened uh, with climate change and fires. And uh, so having those services available is really, it's something we just have to deal with. Yes. So, <laughs> I've also been a fireman for 26 years, um, well, well established in the wildfire community. Um, we talk about fires and, and what's going on. You know, that's, that's also could be considered a political statement. That's, those are some things that, you know, lack of preparedness has definitely caused the, a lot of the expansion of those fires. Um, there's, there's a lot of stuff that can be put into that. And, I, and I've been on several boards and committees as far as looking into, you know, urban fires and, and what, what we could do to mitigate the, the exposure. And, and a lot of people just, they don't want to hear it. They want to let their places overgrow. They, you know, they don't want to clean out the forests and around those residential areas. So that there's, there are some issues there, but back to policy A, that they encourage population to locate and establish service areas. That, that doesn't mean that we can't establish new service areas. That doesn't mean that we can't, you know, look at, okay, we have land A that we are going to propose some apartments or something like that for. There are areas that we can put in those septic systems or 
or, or other options. I, I don't think that we should be limiting as much in writing as, as some, some of us are, are proposing. I think that, you know, encourage population to locate into established service areas or, or, or add something um, or uh, areas where service areas could be expanded um, instead of just kind of stopping it at, nope, we're not gonna, if there's no service to this area, you know, you speak about police and fire. Uh, um, I'm in a unique position where I've been a fireman for 26 years. I'm, I'm a police officer in Seaside as well. The areas are serviced. I, I promise you that they're not going to be not serviced. Um, police and fire have have a huge plan to service the entire county. Now, if there's lack of um, if there's lack of employment, that's a whole different op or, or whole different problem that they're working to go to, to mitigate. But I, I think that. Just saying that we don't have service areas is is kind of limiting our our growth and what we're here to talk about. Um, I, I'm not sure what the wording needs to be, but I, I think it needs to be more vague and not more restrictive. If that, I guess, if that's what I'm trying to say. I I agree with uh, the comments that uh, Commissioner Crusher, uh just made uh, these policies just we need to make sure that they don't conflict with one another but this any policy that says encourage this that or the other thing it's not discouraging anything else it's encouraging this and it it is appropriate for us to encourage population in places that are ready to take it but it doesn't say we won't and and that we don't need additional areas. I believe we do need additional areas. I think these policies should be kept as short and simple as possible. And this one's a good one. So I'm in favor of keeping it as is. Uh, I would I would say that uh, the policy B maybe uh, does head in the direction that uh, that Jason, you are suggesting, but I is there any is there anybody who wants to alter policy A beyond uh, balancing with carrying capacity? I'm for leaving it the way that it is. I think it's it's vague, it's to the point, and it's it serves its purpose. Okay, anyone else? I can concur, especially looking at policy B. Okay, let's move to policy B. Any comments on that? Hearing nothing, we can move on. Uh, policy C. Could it be better defined? Uh, what would be, what do you mean by that? Well, <clears throat> between developments or committed land. So developments are already housing and mm -hmm. committed lands. Does that mean the forestry, egg forestry lands? No, that, I would think that means land that's already committed to, um, to residential development. Infill might be a familiar yeah, term. Infill. Right, infill. It seems pretty straightforward to me. Any objection <laughs> to that? It's straightforward. I just not being, a, yeah, it is. Okay, I'm not a planner, so that's fine. That's okay. It, that, it, that means fill in the blanks between people's houses before yeah. you kind of expand some new places. Yeah. Gotcha, okay. Okay, policy D. So you're sort of just moving along uh, what, using what you've got first. Anybody object to policy D or want to add to it? Okay, policy E. I have a question though. So yes. directing you know, to the new urban growth boundary, it's all, we're trying to utilize what we already have within but there's, there's also those other restrictions that I spoke about earlier. You know, if you're in a floodplain, if you're in 
you're in a tsunami inundation zone, we have to be more, we have to, we have to look at those areas. We, we have a lot of those areas. We have a ton of them. But if we, if I go to the planning department and say, hey, I want to do this, instead of getting an, a no, it's not within our policies or our, or our objectives, what, what can we do to encourage the utilizing what's within the boundary without going outside instead of instead of moving due east because that's kind of where we've all i mean we can't go west obviously we know that north and south are are what they are so everybody's kind of focused on going east um but what can we do to utilize the existing lands if we're if we're encouraging people to utilize the existing lands we have to look at being able to use those existing lands Non-residential development would be my suggestion. I mean, use those flat lands by water places as transportation, warehousing, anything where kids don't sleep overnight. But otherwise, I see those as pretty hard boundaries. I mean, they are hard boundaries. Um, it's just so tempting to go into those. And I understand the motivation, uh, but uh, it's... I don't disagree with what you're saying at all. I mean, the, the one that I spoke about earlier is actually zoned commercial and it still can't, we can't build a commercial building there because of these hardships that we're talking about. It's not that I'm trying to build houses or anything. I mean, there are some like in Gearhart and, and Seaside, like we spoke yeah. of, those are city, city problems. We're not going to deal with those, but some of these other areas, it's hard to promote commercial growth as well, which we need to sustain population coming up we have to we have to have some commercial growth but it's it's really hard to build in some of these areas and i would be supportive of making it easier to put non-residential developments in those spots than residential and um, still go east for residential but allow commercial and non-overnight residents in those places so i think there is some gray room if we if we realize we have the real restrictions gail gail how can we address that you know in in some of these areas where I'm sure that the state level has some sort of impact on what we can and can't do as well. But as a county, can we override some of that stuff or how does that work? So first of all, if it's in the urban growth boundary, the county is gonna have a very limited role because the zoning that's in place, the permit review that occurs is being done by the cities. So um, the county is going to have a, a, a very limited say in what goes on. Um, speaking directly to the floodplain issue, uh, this is more than a state issue. This is FEMA. Uh, so, and if the county and or the cities want to continue to participate in the National Flood Insurance Program, we are bound to adhere to FEMA's rules. And FEMA's rules are only going to get more rigid. And you'll see over the next couple of years, uh, FEMA has been involved with this biological opinion uh, dealing with Endangered Species Act species. And the rules that you think are tough now are going to become much more stringent over the next probably four to eight years moving forward. So I don't know how we address uh, the FEMA issue unless we pull the county out of the flood insurance program. Uh, and then we can do whatever we want, basically. Uh, the reason to ask is because a lot of our property is in that area, correct? The, the unused property that we could talk about in, in within the county. So then we have to start directing. If that's just going to be a, a hard no, we have to start looking at the forestry land and at the eastern boundaries and, and stuff like that. And that's kind of where I'm trying to direct everybody's attention. And we can't you know, want something over here, but if it's unattainable and we can't do it, then we need to really start focusing on what we can do, you know, minimizing all of our, our output of, I mean, we have so much effort going to stuff, but if it's something that's not going to be even allowed, no matter how hard we try, then we need to start focusing on what we can is kind of where I'm going with that. Yeah, that I mean, to go, to go back, I'm not sure exactly which properties you're talking about, Jason, but I know that there are areas of the county where they are, FEMA shows them in a floodway, um, and there are existing homes, you know, that have been built maybe in the 60s, and so, I mean, maybe one thing that the county could do to assist would be in the unincorporated areas is to do hire an engineer to do the work, to do a map amendment with FEMA to take those properties out of the floodplain, um, you know, especially if they are incorrectly in there. 
Um, but that would be something that would be the the immediate thing that I could think of that the county could have a direct role in and um, address some of those issues. And some of the properties that I'm talking about are areas where I know that we could build more affordable housing, you know, right outside the highway 26 junction going towards going towards Portland and some of those areas, you know, there's there's, you know, we're going to encourage manufactured homes or mobile homes. There's some of those parks out there where you just can't put in another one because of if you take something out, you're going to be up against a floodplain issue. Um, those are areas where we can try and build on what we already have, but we're having issues on that. Um, there's there's some, you know, in the Warrenton area, there's some in the Gearhart area, the same thing, the eastern end side of Gearhart. There's, there's, there's a lot of these areas that we're talking about encouraging what we already have, but if we just can't, then we need to start encouraging what we can. And so then I think policy E would be something to delete, which is our next policy, because that's what restricts us from moving east. Um, you know, that, that, that policy E really, you know, stops the conversation because resource value equals timber. And it's, it's yeah. so we come up against that 87% of the county um, con confining us geographically. Yes, Jim. Uh, uh, Patrick, I, I don't believe that that uh, policy E was developed in a vacuum. I believe that's part of the OARs. Uh, in terms of that's where you should go is to the encourage development with least resource values. It doesn't mean that you can't develop in higher resource values, but you need to look at the lower ones first and then make an argument why you can't use them. Excellent. Thank you for that clarification. Jim. And, and also, while I have uh, Jan, while I have the floor, I'd like to uh, propose a couple of uh, concepts. I actually have some draft uh, policy language yeah. and they they go hand in hand. Thank you, Jen. One of them is, you know, these we've talked about in the past. One of them is like natural hazards shall be taken into account when creating new or expanded residential zones. And then the second one is building a natural hazard zone should take into account the hazards during the permitting process. So um, looking at at the maps that uh, that Gail had up on uh, earlier uh, this morning. I don't feel comfortable saying you can't build anything in these areas because that's quite frankly, it gets into a lot of legal issues as well as just um, taking so much land out of, you know, out of uh, the building base. But on the other hand, uh, the, current, the current policy is essentially no policy. You can build in some of these areas. It's up to the individual to assess what the natural hazards are. So this is sort of a middle of the road saying, you know, let's take a look at these natural hazards. Um, maybe we could tweak the wording to say, you know, encourage to less uh, less hazardous areas, but not forbid building entirely because uh, as uh, uh, Commissioner uh, Jason uh, said that uh, there are ways to mitigate some of these, uh, some of these issues. I get off my soapbox and I'd <laughs> like to hear some response. I'd, I'd say rather than getting all wrapped up in doing an expensive mitigation that's probably going to be ineffectual in the long run for a lot of these places that are low, uh, we should use those properties in the large amount of land that falls into those categories that are not good building choices as ammunition for the county to go to the state and say, we need to take some of the less productive forest land and begin to use it where we can safely build residential housing. Uh, Chris, I don't think we're really at odds because if you do what I suggested, you're going to come up with essentially your argument for extending uh, UGBs, for instance, because you, you, you'll you find that you don't have adequate areas that are outside of natural hazards. But if you do, if you're forced to build, I don't know of, of what uh, uh, DLCD will, will state, will say, but if you're essentially saying you can't expand UGBs, then you have to do something within what we have now, and that's where that second uh, proposed uh, uh, policy comes in about 
uh, you need to uh, take into account the hazards during the permitting process. So that's it. Thank you, Jim. Cheryl, you've had your hand up. I like what uh, Jim was proposing, and I'm wondering if um, Jim can put it in the form of a, of a policy for us, a proposed policy, and I don't know if that's one policy or two, um, but if you wanted to give us some wording and, and then we could vote. At this point in time, I'm in support of it. Okay, I do have, this is just what I would consider a draft policy, but I do have two written already. Uh, the first one is natural hazards shall be taken into account when creating new or expanded residential zones. Now, I'm not sure if zones is the, is, is the proper terminology. That's, that's number one. The second one would be building a natural hazard zones should take into account the hazards during the permitting process. Can we, can we talk about one at a time so we don't get confused? Sure. sure. Uh, um, um, the first one, I, I have a question on the first one. So the natural hazards, and I'm, I'm trying to remember what you said exactly, shall be taken into consideration when proposing a new development? Correct. What, what does that mean though? Does that mean that the planning department or, or what has, okay, so I wanna build on a, on a piece of wetlands and, or, or a flood area. Okay, so now we took into consideration that that was a flood area. What does that mean from there? Does that mean, okay, now you can't build there or now, yeah, we were considering that that's a flood area, but if you propose to do this and this to where, yeah, we can mitigate some of those. I, I, I'm not sure what that, I like where you're going with it, but I'm not sure what that means. Because that okay, leaves a, a vague term. Now I can explain at least what I have in my mind is a natural hazards would be defined by, by the state because the state has uh, a number of uh, maps that uh, has been issued that identifies a number of these hazards. So that's where the, the zoning, so to speak, or the, the, the overlay really, it's more of an overlay would come from. Uh, the second one is say, essentially saying it's not forbidding you to develop but you need to take into account and mitigate the specific hazards in that area where you, where you would like to build. And from what you've been saying, Jason, you've already been doing that. Well, the county and every city has been doing that as well, because we all have a process for uh, building in the floodplain. We have a process for building in landslide areas. Um, most, Gearheart probably has some regulations on their books about developing in the inundation zone, the county really doesn't have any. Um, so I, I, well, I want to I, I I clarify I what you're trying to get at. Well, I didn't see any policies that are identifying that. It's good to hear that the county is doing it, but shouldn't it be in the policy? Yeah. Uh, I could see having mitigation be part of that too. I think the floodplain, and I won't even mention the T word, but floodplain I, um, FEMA regulations alone, I think make that a hard no if we we're gonna plan out, Jason. Um, where I think this has traction for me is moving east. And as a hazards guy, I'm like, get out of the tsunami zone and go into the forest fire zone. Um, I understand that that's kind of what I'm saying. But in this context, I think what it could be is, given all the hazards we're looking at, going into this forested area at least can be mitigated before the fire comes with all of those clearing and other activities that you were talking about. Whereas in the flood tsunami repeated issues, there's sort of less mitigation potential. So maybe this could get to something where we could look at going somewhere with mitigation in mind for the hazard. I think the flood zone is a real tough example to try to work around, but the other landslide and other things might have some more uh, mitigation components that would make that consideration a consideration. This doesn't sound like it's a prohibition. No. I, I think that we should pay attention to the headings for these different policies. And the policies we're considering now are under the heading of urbanization and development policies. I think some of what we've been talking about in the last few minutes is more appropriate under housing policies and residential development. Thank you. Good note. 
Yeah, I wasn't sure ex where would be the most appropriate place. So uh, it's, it's perfectly fine with me to put it in that very first section. Um, I, I'd like to have, before we go into a formal motion, I'd like to hear, personally, I'd like to hear some discussion, um, uh, informal discussion, not formal discussion, and uh, and maybe tweak the language if we if we need to. I, have I don't have I don't have a chat, or else I would just paste it in there. I had a question on like policy E. I'm I'm reading this: encourage development of land use with less resource value. What do what are we doing to encourage? Are we giving tax breaks? Are we giving breaks to people that would would be in those areas to to develop? Or are we just saying, hey, would you please do this? I, I'm kind of confused as to that too. To, to really incentivize people to build in those areas or to develop in those areas. I think it's intentionally left a little nebulous. It's, it's just, there's a lot of possibilities in doing that kind of thing. And the county should be open to looking at those ideas as they come up that, that fall under that category. So it's, it's not specific, it's, it's very broad. And I think the idea is, again, we're not talking about wrecking good resource land, high quality forest production land, high quality agricultural land. Let's look at the stuff that's got less value that way for ag and forestry if we're gonna develop outside of what's already zoned for residential. That, that's the way I take the policy. And I but think I, it's fine that it's kind of vague and, and fuzzy. I'd like to make a comment as a plannerly comment. Um, we are doing a comprehensive plan. We're not doing a specific plan and how the county decides to implement the policy uh, then comes later. And you know, we, we really can't cover every possible circumstance. Jan. Yes. Jan. yes, go ahead, Charles. Um, so the way I interpreted that statement of encouraging, um, it brought to mind the example of uh, doing trade. So if the, the county, I think, owns quite a lot of land um, in, in forested areas, and somebody earlier had brought up the idea of getting the county to uh, encourage people to trade land in the hazard area for lands that perhaps are are in the forested area. So, so, so that was my interpretation of encourage. Thanks. Okay, Jen. Yes, yeah. All right, so I, I want to make sure that we're keeping in mind how the statewide planning system works. So it's not a simple matter of Jan has a piece of property that's in Astoria, that's in a really steep slide zone. And she comes to the county and says, hey, I'm gonna give you my piece of land for your piece of forest land that's you know out off of 103. It's not that simple because what the, I, I don't even know what you're trying to, what you're thinking with your land swap, Charles, but we do have a lot of parameters that we work in. If you want to take land in a forest zone or a farm zone, which are our resource zones, and you want to pull it out of a resource zone, there's a process you go through called a goal exception. And it's going to be uh, what's called a reasons exception. So it means you have to have valid reasons to take that land out of resource zone. And remember, our whole statewide planning system, which began in 1973, is set up to protect farm and forest lands. That is the entire goal. And so for a reasons exception, we will have to show that a there is no other land currently available in the county that's zoned for what we want to do. So first of all, we're going to have to show the state that there is no land that's zoned for residential. We're going to have to show, and this may be doable, but we still have to show it and meet all the reasons um, that the, the land that's um, already zoned for residential is, cannot be deve developed for that use. I'm, I'm phrasing this wrong, but basically we're going to have to show that the 
developing, taking this land out of forest land is going to be just as easy to develop as the land that's in the city. So, and there is a, a, one more reason that I can't remember, but there is a process we have to go through and we're going to have, it's a very high bar and the state has to sign off on it. So it's not just a simple matter of the counties and the cities get together with some property owners and we change deeds up and everybody goes away happy. There's going to be a lot of work that will have to go into it. And I want people to understand how the process is going to work so that there's no false expectations that we're going to put a policy in and this is going to happen within two weeks. So, sorry. It's also quite a political process. The county commissioners would need to be kind of unanimous and real vigorous over time with the state to, you know, understand that this is something that we really need. Um, one of the arguments, though, is uh, the, the planning program was developed in the Willamette Valley for agriculture, and the coastal concerns were not considered uh, in, in, in very deeply. And I think we do have some ground for um, some exception uh, arguments, um, but it will be a long and a political process. Yeah, and I think we need to keep in mind as well that, you know, we talked earlier about over 80% of our land is in forest zoning, and we have to think who, who owns that property. Okay, it's, some of it is going to be the state. Um, a lot of it is in private timber industry ownership. Um, I don't see any of them involved in our discussion today. I don't see any of us mentioning them and the impacts to them. Um, we've just gone and rezoned their property and, and not included them in the discussion at all. So I hear a little frustration there. Okay, but I just want us to be realistic and understand the parameters that we work in because we as unincorporated county are not a city. And yes. I know we want to step up and do the right thing and do as much as we can, but we have to realize that the state system is not set up for us to provide urban level services and urban level densities. So I, I certainly appreciate all those comments and, and clarifications for us, Director Henriksen. And I don't have as full of an understanding as you do, but I do understand well enough exactly what you mean and understood in everything I've said so far this morning that it's not easy to make these changes, but as difficult as it may be, I think those kinds of changes, expanding urban growth boundaries into resource lands and getting permission from the state to do it, is exactly what we're going to need to do in the long run. And we might as well get started on it tomorrow. It's going to take years. I understand that. The other thing is on the forest land business, there are a lot of small land owners that have forested land. It's classified, it's zoned forest. It's AF uh, and, and some of it's probably F80. And and those owners may be willing to engage in some transfer of, of land at some point. So it's not all just ODF or Greenwood or Hampton. It's a lot of small uh, landowners, probably something like 10% of the county is small forest landholders. Uh, to Chris, do you, is, is, you want to risk putting that in any kind of language or? No, I, I don't. I, I think the language here, I'd be fine with saying, let's just accept the urbanization and development policies A through H that we have up there right now and move on to uh, the next section. We're, we're making a lot of good comments and discussion on this stuff. I love it. And, and some of this stuff we're going to have to do. But for this document, we need some distinct policies that can be implemented when this comp plan gets approved later this year. Okay, thank you. Uh, Cheryl, I see your hand first. We're kind of hopping around, um, which is okay. Um, I would like to take us back. Um, Gail, can you show us the, the phrasing for the two proposals that Jim made? Okay, so, so, so Gail, just process-wise, 
they are now down under residential development and not up under urbanization. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, yes. Okay, no problem. I, if they were in urbanization, I was going to make a motion and we can vote on them, but we will wait until we get to um, residential. No problem. Thank you. Jim, did you still have a comment? Um, yeah, well, I, I did. It was along the line as Cheryl. Uh, I was concerned that uh, the my discussions was being sort of left behind, but I see since they're there. Uh, eventually, uh, well, when we get to them, uh, I, we, then I will actually make a formal proposal and then we can go through the formal process. Okay. Well, uh, so we'll go back to- I'd like to make a motion. Okay. I move, we accept policies A through H as amended to this point under urbanization and development policies. Do I hear a second? All. Do I hear a second? Is there anyone willing to? Okay. It's been made, moved and seconded that we accept the policies as amended, A through H. Uh, all in favor, uh, say aye. 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 All aye. Opposed? All opposed? You, I think that's kinda, hmm? yeah, I was going to say, you're kind of forgetting the discussion for the motion, but. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I mean, I, I just had a comment that I think that uh, although I'm new on the planning commission, I think that some of the stuff you guys are trying to get through pretty quickly and, and just kind of go through. Um, I, I don't know how many meetings you guys have had on all this stuff, but there's, there are some things in there that uh, as an impact to a builder and stuff, I think that you guys would be creating a lot of extra costs in, um, in trying to move forward with affordable housing and stuff like that, such as, you know, you, you want to require somebody to have an analysis of the impact of infrastructures and public facilities, and then in policy H, include an analysis that the proposed will not exceed significantly burden on public facilities. Those, those analyses that, that you're re requiring are going to be very extensive in price. I'm just, just saying that they're they're not cheap and they're not affordable housing friendly. Just, just my my comments on some of these things. There's there's a lot of things that I think that are are left for some some bad interpretation. You guys, it's already passed, but it's just my my two cents. Yeah, my response would be um, that I think a lot of this is um, staff work. Uh, you know, in, in terms of when you walk in the door, the, the county is, is going to already have an idea on some of these things. Um, and a lot of it is simply complying with what state level um, policy or state, state level direction is. So I, I'm hoping it doesn't add um, significant burdens, but it, but in fact, you know, um, oh, policy G and H are directly going to be related to county policies. If I, as a developer, want to come and create something, then I am going to have to provide that to the county. It's not something that the county is going to go and do. There, it says it shall be required. You know, it, it means that they're going to require me to put that in, whether it's we put the little rubber strips on the road and and see what how much traffic flow or it's, it's going to be hiring an outside source, a company that, that does this. So it, it's, it's going to prolong the process of, of building houses. It's going to prolong the process of the application period. And it's going to, it's going to make things more expensive. Um, and I'm just trying to go back to, you know, we're, we're talking about affordable housing. We're talking about trying to get more houses. And if we keep raising the bar higher and higher and higher, guys like me, and, and there's a lot of us that are trying to do these things, it's the cost of things are going to get out of control. I mean, they already are, but they're just going to keep getting higher and higher. So I don't know. There's not a, there's not a set bar that you have to be to where it will not significantly burden public facilities. I mean, I don't know where that bar would be, or um, I could see where the, you know, 
water is an easy one. You, if you're going to build out in Lewis and Clark, you go to Lewis and Clark Water District, you say, can I get a, a meter? They either say yes or no. That, that's an easy one. But the other stuff like, the, you know, we're not going to burden schools and sanitary and uh, emergency services and stuff like that. It, it's, it's kind of a it's kind of a mute point in some of this stuff because you have to, you have to go to the fire department and they'll provide you service. You have to go to the, the water department. They'll provide you service. Is that what we're requiring? Cause we already require those things. So. So. Yeah. So this, I think this is already required today. Yeah. So if you come in today, Jason, and say, I have 30 acres out on Clatsop Plains and I want to subdivide that property. We're going to tell you you're going to need to show what your impacts on the roads are and you're going to have to demonstrate that you have water to serve that thing and you're going to have to serve prove that the fire department is okay with what you're doing and especially maybe um, more importantly with emergency access to the subdivision so and i think those things are basic yeah. basic planning tools that we use to you know make sure that we have some semblance of quality of life um and if you came in today for a new subdivision or a partition um or you want to rezone the land it's going to be the same thing you have to you have to show that there are services available to serve the property and do what you want to do so i'm i'm not sure i mean we could eliminate all these things and just kick that can 20 years down the road and say we're not going to look to to accommodate affordable housing we're not going to look at the schools and if they're over capacity and we have to put in more portables then that's okay and if there's not enough water out there to serve you then that's okay um and if there causes traffic that's okay too um we'll deal with it 20 years from now because the goal is to get people in houses but what's going to happen 20 years from now are we just going to kick that can 20 years down the road and say well you know we didn't look at it 20 years ago so now it's too late and I'm not arguing with you, but I'm trying to understand how how that trade off. I understand that it helps in the immediate short run, but in the long run, are we doing the right thing over a 20 year period if we just ignore this that already exists on our books? What I was getting at is you brought up the school. So if, if me as a, a developer or, or anybody, and for that matter, because I'm not, I'm just a small time builder. If someone goes and says, hey, I want to build 30 houses here in Lewis and Clark, and the school says we can't do that, are we going to then say, well, there goes our, our affordable housing, there goes housing that people are, who are probably going to live here and work here and go to school here? If, so I know that schools have their own projection. They have, to, they have to provide or plan for the future as well. I'm just trying to say, where, where is that bar? Um, we're trying to encourage growth and not not uh, prohibit it so much. Well, the other thing is that there are 41,000 plus people living in our county now who already live here, have services that they depend on. They have a quality of life that they bought into. It means something to them. They don't want their whole lives destroyed so somebody can put up a house in an inappropriate area that does not have sufficient services. So there's the other side to the coin. And I've been on the planning commission now for about, I don't know, three, four years. And we've taken up applications for building in different areas of the county. And these uh, policies here that ask for consideration be given to things like fire protection, water availability, sewer availability, or appropriate for septic tanks. That's never been a really big problem. Yes, I agree. It adds a little to the cost, but that's the price you pay when you're inserting yourself into an existing community with people that have lived there maybe for decades and expect some decent quality of life to be preserved in their neighborhoods and their communities. These are very basic and reasonable policies. Uh, I'm going to suggest that we, we've already had a vote that we move on to the next section. Thank you for the comments. 
So under residential development, we have already added two policy statements. I have a, uh, a point of discussion on policy D of that subsection. Okay. Uh, policy D is shall uh, class of county shall permit residential development in those designated areas when and where it can be demonstrated that and it lists A through D uh, all important things but I felt like we should consider whether there should be mention of transportation and commercial support so I was going to suggest adding an item E that uh, says that adequate transportation and commercial support are available or will be built. And I know this goes directly <laughs> in the face of those that want to keep costs down, but again, it's a matter of building the right thing in the right place and doing it well so that our communities are worth more our values are preserved that's what i'm interested in I have a question if i may sure go ahead Carl. Uh, uh sure for our would you, can you help me understand what you mean by commercial support well I didn't know how to word that exactly. I'm thinking a very small scale. For example, um, if significant housing is developed over time in an area, it, it's nice if those residents, if they're in an outlying area, have access perhaps to a, a, a fueling station or electric charging station or a a uh, laundromat or a small grocery store, that kind of thing, that that you don't just put a bunch of residents out in the middle of nowhere and have them all commuting in and out 10, 15 miles to get what they need. I think it should just be considered. It's not a game changer. It's not a deal breaker, but these are considerations that should be uh, thought of before additional development takes place. I'm just not sure how that was within the county's control. Yeah, yeah, that, that was my, I mean, I understand the consideration, but the way it's preference of uh, in those designated areas, when and where it can be demonstrated that. Uh, I just don't know how a, a developer is gonna ensure commercial support unless he also puts in some sort of retail facility. I can understand well, in the interest of the commercial of, support. Well, in the interest of getting through our agenda today, I withdraw the suggestion. Thank you. I think there are some problems there. I mean, uh, we can widen 101, for instance. Uh, Cheryl? My phone's ringing in the background here, sorry. Um, I would remind us, um, for one thing is that um, Nadia Gardner had proposed two additional policies. So I'm just noting that we should not forget those. And I, um, again, Gail, can you show us the ones that uh, Jim has popped in there? And I'm ready to uh, make a motion so that we can keep moving forward. Thank you. Uh, I move that we adopt policy K. Is there a second? Second. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All of, I'm sorry, I forgot the discussion part, but all opposed? Okay, I think that passes. Policy. L, is there a, is there a motion? Yes, uh, I I propose uh, uh, I, I motion that uh, policy L be adopted or draft policy L. Is there a second? Second. <clears throat> is there any discussion? 
Well, if there's no discussion, then um, does everyone who is in favor say aye. 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 All, those, all those opposed? Thank you. Um, I don't have Nadia's comments right in front of me. I, they're around here someplace. Is this a, a place that's appropriate to add those comments? Jan, it, yes. it looks like that um, Gail is on her way to find it. Um, yes. I, because um, Nadia sent him out a day ahead of time, I printed mine and I have mine in front of me. Um, if it's useful for Gail, I can read them. If it's faster for her to pull them up. Ah, here we go. She's good. Good. Um, okay. Uh, I move that we add a policy, whatever the correct letter is, as currently written and labeled policy K, but what, what are that wording and then whatever is the correct letter. I mumbled my way through that. I'm moving for that one. <laughs> you did it. Very good. Is there a second? Whoops. Maybe we'll wait until that's actually on the screen. Okay. Is there a second to that motion? Yeah, I'll second that. Is there any discussion? I think it's a very significant policy, I will just mm -hmm. say. So uh, are you ready to vote? Um, all those in favor of adding policy M, say aye. 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 Uh, all those opposed? And it passes unanimously. Thank you. Shall we move on to um, page 23? I have uh, a policy, I guess it'd be a, a, uh, a motion for a policy that would be, I guess, in which parallels with or expands upon uh, the comment policy that uh, Chair Gardner uh, submitted in her written statement where she says uh, add policy that Clatsop County should limit the number of short-term rentals to help housing, help support housing. I, I had written my own verbiage on that and I'm proposing um, that policy and the, the county should restrict the number and geographic distribution of short-term rentals in order to increase the number of housing units available for county residents. So everyone sees that. Second the motion. Okay, we have a motion and a second on the floor. Shall we have discussion? Yeah, I have a... Just a second. I think I see Lam's hand first. Lam? Yeah, sorry. Am I on? Yeah. Yes, you are. Well, um, I, I guess I still have that same question as before. Um, since the um, effect, it seems like the complaint was coming from mostly from um, very small area. 
of um, for the short term rental. And I'm wondering if if this is severely affecting uh, other areas. And um, so I, I've seen some comments that people are posting about this and I'm still kind of having really a lot of issues trying to s resolve how that is uh, measuring up to what we're severely limiting the, uh, the, the short-term rental, uh, which is I understand that really in some affecting some um, housing. And as far as that goes, I don't, mm, I don't know if we have heard enough from different residences in, in different uh, area of the county to make this uh, decisions um, mm, I, I, yeah, I mean, I, I guess that's, that's, that's my questions and comment on that. I'd like to respond to those comments and thank you for making them. Uh, it is a common thread that you hear, but, um, uh, it's important to realize that the purpose of the restriction on the number and distribution of these short-term rentals is to help alleviate our housing shortage. Uh, it also will address some specific areas where there have been complaints about the way they're operated, but that problem can probably be handled differently. This, this policy is mainly suggested to help increase our housing supply for permanent residents. And the number of short-term rentals in the county right now is only some 160 or 80 or something like that. So it isn't a huge number yet, but the numbers are increasing at a very high rate over the last few years. And so with that in mind, I think it's important for the county to get out in front of it and to think about what is an appropriate number and where are the places that they should be allowed. I'm not saying don't have them. I'm just saying restrict the number and the geographic distribution. That leaves it open for others to decide. As to the discussion around this and not having heard from enough people that favor STRs, uh, there will be a planning commission that takes up goal 10, an actual regular planning commission meeting and we take public comment at that time and a case can be made by people at that meeting and a vote can be affected by what is learned at that meeting and at this meeting too public comment is welcome but rarely provided I, I would, this is Jan, and I would just note that I think all of the cities have been working on this kind of policy and either have adopted it already or have it in the works because it is certainly an issue for the incorporated areas. Jan, Jan I've got my hand up for oh, comments. I'm sorry, too. can't see you. Uh, go ahead. Uh, thank you. So, well, A, I just wanted to let you know that I'm here. Um, I don't necessarily have an interest in uh, changing you out as chair, um, but I'd be happy because in part it lets me make comments. So I'm going to make a oh, comment right. while I still can. Okay. Um, so I I will just uh, note I have concern on this uh, the wording for policy in in that uh, it doesn't give us a limit to to where we increase to or a motive for um, for how much we want to increase housing uh, or where we should, uh, what measurement we should have to, to restrict and to what level that restriction applies. So, you know, I'm, I, I view the current wording as just sort of indiscriminately increasing housing in the, in the county, uh, which I don't, agree with um and i 
and you know to sort of what Lam is talking about I think that restrictions are appropriate if uh, the short-term rentals are edging out permanent housing for that residents need uh, but you know I, I would really want some some guidance on how how staff is to make that determination uh, so I, I'll just say that I'm uncomfortable with the current warranty I don't necessarily have a good amendment for that uh, I think that frankly it's probably a series of policies to to come come at that problem but that's just what I would express on this. I'll also Can I say come in? Jan, uh, Gail has her hand up too. Okay, well, Gail, Susanna, shall we let Gail speak first and then, then you? Is that okay, Gail? Okay. Yes. Yeah, so my only question would be, um, the concern I have is about the, uh, I understand the intent is to increase the number of housing units for county residents, but there's no way that the county can enforce that uh, unless we're going to eminent domain people's property and use it and become the housing authority ourselves. So I understand what you're trying to say, but I'm just not sure how we're going to accomplish that or mandate it or implement it or enforce it. Okay, well, I, I guess it's clear to me that the way I worded it left a misunderstanding. I'm not saying that the county should in any way uh, use this restriction on the number and places that short-term rentals are allowed uh, for any reason other than to prevent existing housing or housing that's being built to be used for short-term rental rather than full-time residents. So my motive here is to try to stop the uh, loss of housing units that our county is incurring because so many built units or those that are yet to be built are being used just for, for part-time occupation. That, that's my reasoning behind it, and maybe somebody can fix the wording to it, but it doesn't sound like it has a, a second or any support. So at this point, we can move on. Whoops, whoops, hang on, hang on. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, this Charles, I had to step away to solve a problem. Um, so could, could you just tell me what the motion is? And policy N, which is up on the screen. Um, okay, it, says, I can't. Uh, it says, Charles, Clatsop of County should restrict the number and geographic distribution of short-term rentals in order to increase the number of housing units available for county residents. Yeah, so I would second that. Okay, well, we have a motion and a second, so we can continue with discussion. Um, my understanding is that that would there be probably be through a business license arrangement of some sort that people would have to come in and apply for that. Is there is already a licensing process in place? Yeah. So they would have to. Can I come? Go ahead. Uh, just. Well, I just. Since I since I put the proposal out there, I guess what I'm thinking more of is a zoning issue of when I say the geographical distribution, where are we going to permit short term rentals? Uh, I see it as a commercial endeavor. And so geographically, I would restrict them to commercial areas. And as to the number, that's something that might vary over time. And so I'm leaving this a generalized kind of policy, just like most of them are in this, to allow flexibility to consider the facts on the ground when decisions are made. There would be some initial numbers set for different areas, perhaps, or different zones. I'm not sure which, but this is to allow at least consideration of what can be done to lessen the steep 
increase in some of our homes in the county being lost for for full-time residents here because they're used for a more lucrative uh, business of short-term rentals. And that's being done on land that wasn't zoned for such commercial purpose. And if I, if I could add a, a couple of comments there. Um, so in the notes that I sent out, or the, the email that I sent out, I, I made a somewhat similar proposal. Um, and my proposal was to uh, put in a, a policy L that said Classic County will retain the existing zoning prohibition for short term rentals or vacation rentals in all existing residential rural land zones. Um, so we, you know, that that provision is already in the current uh, zoning ordinance, uh, at least certainly for the coastal residential zone. Um, and and I th certainly think that zoning ordinance should stay the way it is uh, for exactly the reasons that Chris said. And there may be, and I believe, I believe that there are other zones besides coastal residential that also already uh, contain that same prohibition uh, because they are zones that are in what, are, what is defined as rural lands. And any of those rural lands are, are supposed to be um, dedicated to residential, low intensity uh, housing in a rural setting where the infrastructure is not in place to support uh, these kinds of commercial activities. So in my mind anyway, um, you know, the adoption of that policy uh, would uh, just keep the current zoning the way it is. Uh, and I think that would be fine. So that's it. Can I comment now? Yes, Suzanne. Two things, one is that it is permitted for farm to table to have people basically like an Airbnb on a farm and serve them food from the land, food, eggs grown there. And I wouldn't want any policy that would make that be in question. And I would like to know what short-term rental is in that, is it the whole house or is it a room? I think Portland long ago said you could rent a room in your house if you live there. And I think that's really important distinction. And would, with that distinction, you would not have less housing units because now many of them that are used short-term rentals are only used that way. Their owners do not live in the houses. So those are my two comments. Oh, and one more comment to for, that. If this is a big issue is worked on throughout the coast and cities and how they enforce it might be evolving. Um, I haven't been on those discussions. I know Gearhart really took it on and that's all. Thanks. I, I think there is a definition for short-term rental and I see Director Henriksen's hand raised and I'm hoping that she might provide us with the distinction because I think Susanna the idea of renting a room is more like an Airbnb kind of arrangement. The owner is present or um, occupies the house, at least as their principal residence. And, and so there are some differences. And I agree that we don't want to lose that uh, option for homeowners to be able to rent a room or to do a, a uh, farm to, to consumer kind of operation. 
that seems special to a special incident to me. Gail, did you want to comment still? Yeah, just to clarify, um, the ordinance defines a short-term rental as, as the entire dwelling unit. Um, and I do want to make everyone aware, in case you're not, uh, that this issue has been before the Planning Commission. The Planning Commission at the beginning of this month recommended that the board only allow short-term rentals in the Arch Cape residential zone and in four commercial zoning districts and two multifamily districts. Uh, the policy or the rec recommendation from the Planning Commission will be going to the board on April 13th for a first public hearing. So I am a little bit concerned that we may be getting ahead of that process and trying to do an end run around it and not letting the public process play out through the Board of Commissioners public hearings. So I just, in case you weren't aware of it, I just wanted to let everyone know. Thank you. Andy, you also had a question or comment. Yeah, uh, well, so maybe this is two parts. Uh, Gail, can I ask, is there any, like say under policy J above, is there any um, designation system within the county at present uh, to designate a area that has shortage of uh, residential housing? Not sure I quite understand your question, but um, so, so I, go ahead. So if we're doing housing needs analysis, does that analysis come back uh, in any way with saying this part of the county needs more housing? I think you could structure it that way. Um, typically, a county doesn't do a housing needs analysis. It's more for mm -hmm. urban uh, and incorporated areas and UGP areas. Um, but I don't see why the county couldn't structure it and say, well, we feel that there should be 35 more units in class of planes and, you know, 100 more units out in Northeast planning area. Um, it, I, I'm not sure what, what we'd want to accomplish with that. Um, or I mean, are we just trying to say that we shouldn't have any more development in one particular geographic area of the county? Instead, we should try to disperse development to other parts of the county. Because uh, really, what we want to do with Goal 14 mm -hmm. um, is channel things into the urban growth boundaries. If we want to look at higher densities and more development, um, so I'm, I'm not, I'm not sure what the end game of your question is. Well, the end game of my question is really that. Again, I, I'm, I'm feeling like policy in is uh, has a goal of increasing housing uh, in the county, which I think is not ideal in, in, in even addressing what you're saying uh, as far as us trying to have growth in urban areas. Like I generally don't think we necessarily want to increase the number of housing units to, uh, available to county residents unless there's a need within a particular community where, you know, we're the county has determined through the housing needs analysis that some community needs more residential housing as opposed to short-term rental housing. So I, you know, I'm trying to get clarification in my mind around what processes already exist to inform uh, the application of this policy in. So where I have a question, I may. Go ahead. Uh, again, on this policy, and I'm uncomfortable only in the fact that I don't know how the county would ever implement this. You know, there's nothing here from a standard or a database or any guides on how they would restrict the number. So I'm really, really uncomfortable in, in how this is worded, but unfortunately, I don't have a suggestion for the wording. Well, do we go to a vote to um, to resolve this, or is there is that a sufficient discussion? Okay. Yes, Jim. Uh, my only suggestion is uh, I've realized that the county commissioners are trying to tackle this, but uh, 
my my question really is to uh, Director Hendrickson, is that policy end seems to be rather innocuous, but also support, but actually not innocuous, supportive of what the commissioners will, the path that they're currently taking, the planning commissioners especially. Uh, and, and if this gives some kind of a support system, a background for long-term uh, uh, restricting and geographic, geographically, as well as the number, uh, this might lend support for the next 20 years to be able to do this. Uh, so that's, the, that's how I'm reading this, is that it's more support of where the county is trying to do. It'd be nice to have a policy to back that up. So a couple of different things there. So the, the, the Planning Commission makes a recommendation to the board. The Planning Commission does not make the final decision. The board has the option of accepting the Planning Commission's recommendations. They can reject them or they can modify them. Uh, my understanding of the direction that the board has given staff in this issue is uh, it is almost diametrically opposed to the recommendation that came out of the Planning Commission, uh, where the board directed staff to add short-term rentals to the residential zoning districts where they have been permitted and operated uh, for several years um, under the ordinance before we had an ordinance and under the ordinance that was adopted in 2018. Uh, so it wasn't as if short-term rentals in 2018 were suddenly magically approved in the county. They operated for years but had no ordinances uh, operating standards. And when in 2018, when the county did adopt their uh, operating standards for the rest of unincorporated county outside of Arch Cave, uh, the one thing they did not do was go back to the zoning code and put in short-term rentals. So into specific zoning codes. So as part of an effort to address that issue, this is where we stand. The board has said, please add them in. We, we think they should be in residential zones. Uh, where we've been issuing permits for the past four and a half years. Uh, the Planning Commission has a recommendation that says, no, they shouldn't be in any residential zone except for Arch Cape because Arch Cape has had them since 2003. Um, and so this is where they are in their policy discussion right now. But so I, I don't know if this policy, if the board would look at that and say, well, that yes, that supports the Planning Commission, but it doesn't necessarily support what I, we, we've heard them say over the past several months, so. No, thank you, Gail. Well, I do have a comment to that. Uh, at the risk of being a heretic, um, certainly the CR zone, uh, coastal residential zone, did not permit short-term rentals. Um, so no one down here ever had a short-term rental permit until 2018 when the county started issuing those short-term rental permits, which was a violation of the code. So the rule, I mean, you, there are at least two legal opinions that say that that, that was not legal to issue those short-term rental permits and that it was not just a violation of the code, it was a violation of what was in the comprehensive plan with respect to rural lands. So there may have been you know, an under the table uh, short term rental or vacation rental uh, that, that individual people um, used, you know, in the years preceding 2018 that, that people either didn't know about or didn't pay attention to. Uh, but the, there was no uh, legal uh, short term rental operation, at least in the coastal residential zone uh in the past so I, i'm a little bit miffed about uh propagating that story which which i don't perceive to be a, an accurate one cheryl uh, i call for the question and i think it will be a divided vote so i would suggest that we do a roll call Okay. I would just like to say one more thing before we go to the vote. And that is that the county participated in and helped pay for a housing study that was completed in 2019. 
And if you read through that housing study, it cites the impact, some information about the impact of short-term rentals. And it suggests that short-term rentals may be part of the problem in our shortage of housing and that it might be reasonable to address the number of short-term rentals that are allowable in the county. So this policy goes right along with what's in that report that the county has already spent money on. And now I am done speaking. <laughs> okay, the question has been called. Uh, so um, I will go through the list. Um, Andy Davis, yay or nay? Nay. Jeez, Andy. Jim Allegria? Yay. Cheryl Johnson? Yes. Charles Dice? Yes. Susanna? Susanna, are you Susanna Gladwin? Um, I'm sorry. Yes, unmute. So I was, I forgot I was muted. I wanted to call the question. I mean, I wanted to have you state We're the voting. question. Is We're that voting now. policy N? Pardon yes. Me? Yes, policy it's N? policy N. Yes. I vote yes. Yes. Okay, Chris Farrar. Aye. Jason? Kasha? Yes. Clark? Yes. Lamb? No. Okay, as I count that. That says yes. That's okay. Oh, that's right. I'm sorry. My list is still lacking. Uh, I think the, the yeas have it. There were two no votes that I caught. Okay, so that, so um, item N stays in. And we, and that I think takes care of all in that, all in that section. And I'm, if I'm sounding flustered, it's because I've lost the meeting on my screen and my Technical tech, techie is gone. So I'm I've got your faces, but I can't get the rest. So I'm working off of the paper that I printed out. Um, so next, we go on to governmental cooperation. Can, cooperation. can I interject something here? I, sure. I'm looking. I'm looking at the time, and as if I recall correctly, uh, Planning Commissioner Kraushar is leaving at 1230. Yes. Maybe we could give him a few mo minutes if he has something uh, regarding these policies that he wanted to make sure to get in. Good, and, and we can then discuss if we're gonna break for lunch because we end at two o'clock. So um, Jason, would you, would you go ahead and, and tell us whatever you need to tell us before you leave? Can you hear me? Yes. So I just I switched to my phone, so I was going to stay on as long as I could, and uh, and head to the ballpark. So if you guys want to keep going, I can. I'll I'll stay here as long as I possibly can. I I just switched from my computer to my phone. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, what do people want to do at your uh, pleasure in terms of breaking for lunch? Should we stop here and, and come back again at quarter till one? That, I, I, I still move. Oh, well, I was just gonna to say to the contrary, since we're, we're stopping earlier uh, and we still have a little ways to go, I would, uh, I would vote for uh, moving on. Am I remembering that we're going to lose Gail at two? Yes, we are. Actually, uh, if you could lose me at five minutes to two, please. <laughs> Thank you. So I, 
I am in, in favor of foraging on without lunch to see if we can, how far we can get before two. Uh, anybody else want to express an opinion or do yeah. you want to take, uh, shall we, uh, I'll just, uh, could you put that in terms of a motion, Cheryl? I move that we not take a lunch break today, uh, perhaps a five minute break instead, and that we continue to work until 2 p.m. Do I have a second? Second. Second. Yeah. Yeah, second. All in favor say aye. 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 Well, let's, aye. Let's, let's take a five minute break right now and um, and and move on to the to the rest of the agenda. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Gail. Um, so, unless there's objection for the from the group, I'll um, I'll take chair back over at this time. Um, so, and to introduce myself, there's a couple new members of the groups that I haven't met before. I don't think. Um, so, Clark and Jason, uh, welcome. My name is Andy Davis. I'm uh, the chair of the Citizen Advisory Committee, um, countywide advisory committee and I uh, normally chair this group. I live in Astoria. Um, Jan, thank you for taking over this morning. Um, on sort of last minute, I, I had some conflicts this morning. I appreciate you stepping up to do that, uh, especially since Nadia wasn't with us either. Um, okay, uh, Gail, it looked like we were on governmental cooperation and coordination under housing policies, is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, and, and I might just ask for people who at least have the capability to do so. I can't see all of the people on, on my screen, at least when we're uh, sharing Gail's screen. Uh, so if you can use the raise hand feature within Zoom, I'd appreciate it. I'll have the participant list up at the side and, and keep an eye on that. And it handily orders you as you put your hands up. So it helps me keep things organized too. Okay, uh, let's see how much we can get through here uh, before we wrap up at 1.55. Uh, so is there any feedback or suggestions for housing policies for governmental cooperation and coordination? Um, I will note here, I think this is just Scrivener's Gale, that we've got a, um, a policy lettering order uh, issue in this section. Uh, repetition of AB. Uh, any any other items that people would like to bring up for governmental cooperation and coordination? I'll give a minute for people to review to see if anything comes to their attention. Okay, so I do have a couple of hands. I see Cheryl and then Jan. Cheryl? I would just uh, remind us that Nadia had um, suggested an added policy and Gail's been doing a nice job of finding those. Yeah, good. Uh, so right now it, it's uh, policy L, but it reads, Clatsop County should work with cities to develop a campaign promoting ADUs where they are allowed. So whatever the correct lettering on that would be. Okay, thank you, Cheryl. Uh, so I'll take that as a motion uh, to add a policy F, um, class of county. I'll read it when Gail has it up on screen. Class of county should work with cities to, de uh, to develop, I think, uh, a campaign promoting ADUs where they are allowed. Uh, is there a second for that motion? Calling again, is there a second for that motion? I second it. Okay, uh, so I have a motion and a second to add a policy F, Class of County should work with cities to develop a campaign promoting ADUs where they are allowed. Uh, just for my own edification, have we uh, written out ADUs prior in the policy? Yes, okay, thank you. Thank you, Gail. I, I see it in policy M above. Okay. Um, all right, any discussion on this motion? 
Jan, is your hand for uh, for a motion external to this? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm going to ignore you for the moment. Then any any discussion on this motion for policy F? Uh, so I think I saw Susanna. It's not a hand, so it didn't come up in order. But uh, Susanna and then Chris. So, uh, this is for Gail. What is the county policy on ADUs? Uh, currently, ADUs on county land. Yeah, currently ADUs are permitted in areas where there is sewer available. Uh, with Senate Bill 391, which was passed in 2021, uh, there is now discussion that the county could allow accessory dwelling units on rural lands like your RA1, RA2, RA5 zones. Uh, the state statute or the bill that passed does have some limitations on there. For example, it's a minimum two acre parcel size. Uh, you cannot use it as a short term rental. Uh, so we've had an initial discussion about this with the Planning Commission back in January, I believe. And we will be uh, taking that discussion from the Planning Commission to the board for a work session on April 20th. And then depending upon direction of the on the uh, from the board, we would go back to the Planning Commission with formal amendments. And then uh, if, if allowed, hopefully we would be able to have all our regulations in place by July when uh, the state process is expected to be completed. Thank you, Gail. Susanna, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay, uh, so I've got Chris, Chris Farrar. Uh, I will uh, probably vote no on this. And it's not that I'm against the idea really, but I have a very profound concern about the push for ADUs in the city of Astoria, which is a almost 200 year old city that's crumbling. It's sliding off the hill. Its infrastructure is overtaxed. The water and sewer system has a huge surcharge on it for maintenance. The city's population has just gone over the 10,000 mark, which will make it subject to uh, more expensive and greater uh, development of, of the support services that are needed for a city of that size. And I'm not at all in favor of the ADUs being pushed into Astoria where the streets are packed with cars because there's insufficient parking required on developed residential properties and a host of other reasons. And so, I realize some of the cities may have perfectly good places for ADUs, but for the most part, the city of Astoria shouldn't have them at all. And so I'm not, I'm not gonna vote for this unless you add a statement that not in Astoria. That's my statement. Thank you, Chris. Uh, I've got Cheryl Johnson. Actually, I believe Jan had her hand up before me. I'm I'm ignoring her because I'm thinking that's a that's a hand from before we started on this motion. Oh, okay, <laughs> okay. Um, I would just remind Chris that uh, Astoria uh, has its own urban growth boundary and its own um, zoning and permitting laws, and just remind us all that what we are doing is the Clatsop County Comprehensive Land Use Plan. And so we're talking about areas outside of urban growth boundaries. So we're not talking about Warrington, Seaside, Astoria. Please read policy F. It, I, it does refer specifically to cities is why Chris is bringing that up. I'll also note that it says where they are allowed. So Astoria could say that they're not allowed there and then they would be excluded from this as, as written. Um, any other comments for discussion here before we move to a vote?
so I already know we've got one member who uh, does not wish to vote in favor here for policy F, um, but let's try for a voice vote and see if we can get a sense of it. Uh, so uh, this is uh, to vote to include policy F. Policy F would read, Class of County should work with cities to develop a campaign promoting ADUs where they are allowed. Um, I'll ask all those in favor of the motion, could you please signify by saying aye. 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 All, those, all those opposed to the motion, signify by saying no. 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 I believe the ayes have it. So the policy F passed. Uh, thank you for the discussion and the vote there, folks. Uh, any other um, motions, topics for inclusion here? Uh, I'll start with Jan, since you had your hand up previously. I'm not sure where this fits, but it seems to me that one of the problems we have, anybody who's who's has a house and has wanted to have something done to it knows how overtaxed our um, building industry is here. I mean, both because of weather and because we simply don't have the number of people um, trained in the building industry that that would match the demand. And so I, um, I'm wondering if I'd like to, like to propose that we uh, add a policy that says encourage the development and expansion of training programs for the building industry, utilizing a cooperative effort between Clatsop Community College and building trade unions. Second. And, and Jan, uh, I might ask you to repeat that so that um, yeah. so that Gail can record it here in a second. Say, say the same thing twice. I'll, I'll just add that I, I spoke briefly. I know the academic dean because he used to live in the apartment below Andy, just in front of my house. And, um, and he said he was talking to the president today and he thought it was a great idea. I just think that we need to expand those opportunities um, for, for new vocations for people. And we, uh, if we have any kind of major building program here, we have people have to come from other areas. So maybe it was time to uh, look at a more coordinated process. Anyway, so I said, encourage the development and expansion of training programs for the building industry. Just, just a second, Jan. Uh, Gail, uh, are you? In a position to record. I'm typing it. I'm typing it on a separate screen because I uh -huh. don't know where it's going to go in the plan yet. Yeah. Okay, thank you. But thank I you am for typing. clarifying that. Sorry. Using a cooperative effort between Clatsop Community College and the building trade unions. Okay. And is there a second for that motion? I'll second, Chris. Okay, thank you, Chris. So it sounds like we're going to have a policy G, um, and I'll wait until Gail has it up on screen so I can read it off here. And did you just put it in a different section, Gail, just for clarification there? Uh, you said policy G, so I put it under Class of County Housing Strategies Report. I'm not sure what policy G is. It the one above? The uh, yeah, governmental I, well, coordination. I've, I'll ask the, the motion maker, uh, Jan, did you intend for it to be in um, the governmental coordination and cooperation section? That, that was the closest I could figure to what it would be. I mean, they're not, the, the community college is, is not a government, okay. but they're an agency of sorts. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you, Gail, for the repositioning there. So, so we've got a motion and a second uh, to add a policy G to governmental coordination and cooperation, is that right? Cooperation and coordination. Uh, that policy G would read, Class of County shall encourage the develop and development and expansion of training programs for the building industry using cooperative efforts between Class of Community College and the building trade unions. 
there is a second for that. Um, I'll open the floor for discussion. Jan, do you want to make opening comment? You, you do still have your hand up. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't take it down. Um, I think it's um, just what I said, that it seems to me that one of the problems in um, any effort we, we want make to add workforce housing or even market rate housing runs, in, it runs into a problem that there just aren't enough builders around and you have to import people in from other areas and you have to house them while they're here. So we need to, it, it would be an opportunity for some of our resource-based uh, families to, um, to move into a building trade. That's all. Thank you. Um, any discussion from the group on this motion? I totally support it. Okay, thank you, Susanna. Gail, uh, you came off mute. Do you have comments? Just to, just to tell you that Jim Allegri has got his hand up physically. Oh, okay. Um, Jim, sorry, I can't see your uh, physical hand, uh, but do you have comment? Uh, yes, I, actually, I, I can't find the uh, show hands uh, today. I mean, I've seen it okay. before. I don't understand why. But anyway, uh, I, I just have a comment in support of it because I do believe the CCC has a construction program in some relationship with some trade unions. But I think of, of having Clatsop County uh, in writing uh, support their, their and expand their programs, I think is a really good idea. Okay. That's it. Thank you, Jim. Uh, Clark, I think I saw a, a clap hands temporarily from you. Yeah, um, yeah. Thank you. I'm technically challenged as usual. Uh, I really am in support of this, but I do have one question. Are there any building trades out there that are non-union and we want to include them? Uh, does anyone, Gail or anyone else have um, feedback on that? I do not. Maybe Jason might. I'm trying to figure this out with my phone. I apologize. I, I can't see anything on my phone. Uh, yeah, I would say the majority majority of the trades here are non-union. There are a few electrical trades or electrical companies that are, are union, but the majority of the builders here locally in Clatsop County are non-union. Um, and I know, I mean, just from a personal standpoint, there's probably six or eight of us that are in a program at Seaside High School that we're trying to get back. When I was younger and in high school, we had a trades program to where we could go out and work with uh, builders and we've just brought that back. I just had a group of kids at one of my job sites here a couple weeks ago um, encouraging this. So yeah, that, that was the only question I had or the only thing I would like to see is maybe delete the unions and just put uh, the building trades or building trade professionals or local building trade or something of that nature. Just because when you're talking about unions, you're talking about a lot of the bigger commercial companies not um that they are the ones that come in and contract with you know the school projects the hospital projects but they're not the ones locally living here and, and such usually jason um i'm going to take that as a, a motion to amend just to see if there's support for it so um, i'll second motion to amend to change building trade unions to uh or excuse me the building trade unions to building trade professionals. That was one of Perfect. the suggestions you had. Uh, and it sounds, like we've, that. it sounds like we've got a couple of seconds. Um, so let, let me just ask for discussion on that change. So the again, the change is to uh, convert the building trade unions to building trade professionals. Uh, is there a discussion on that motion or amendment? Andy? Pat. I guess I would want to uh, ping Jan and ask if there was a particular reason for that language in the original, or if that was just sort of shorthand and that this, that would not fundamentally change the motion. Jan, do you have a comment for us on that? I have no objection to that at all. I, it was just um, the you. discussion I'd been in, so that's fine. Okay. Uh, any other discussion on this amendment? OK, 
Okay, let's let's go to a vote. Is there any objection to the change from the building trade unions to building trade professionals? Any objection to that change? Then without objection, I think that passes. Uh, thank you for the suggestion, Jason. Uh, so let's go back to discussion overall of policy G. Any more discussion on this policy G? Okay, uh, I'm not seeing any hands or hearing voices on this. So let's go to a vote, I'll reread it here. So we've got a motion to include policy G. Clatsop County shall encourage the development and expansion of training programs for the building industry using cooperative efforts between Clatsop Community College and building trade professionals. Is there any objection to the inclusion of that policy G? Any objection? Hearing no objection, the policy passes. Uh, thank you for the suggestion, Jan, and the feedback, Jason. Okay, uh, let me check one more time. Are there any other items uh, for housing policies, uh, governmental cooperation and coordination? Seeing no hands, hearing no voices, uh, let's move down. Uh, if, if we need to go back, that's fine. Uh, just let me know, uh, but let's try for housing policies, Clatsop County Housing Strategies Report. Any uh, feedback or motions for Clatsop County Housing Strategies Report section? And we'll take a second here in case people need to look through them. And again, I apologize. I, I can only see a half dozen or so of you on my screen <coughs> right now. So uh, if, if you've got a physical hand up and I'm not calling on you, uh, feel free to speak up, but I would prefer you use the reaction hand so that I can see it on the sidebar. Jan. Oh, you're muted, Jan, sorry. I just had a question as to whether policy B um, runs, runs counter to state policy. Gail, do you have any feedback on that? I don't think it runs counter because it says we should determine if there are opportunities. It's not saying we would raise them. Um, there may be some limited instances where we could, uh, where we have existing water and sewer districts where we might be able to increase density, um, but I, I think we'd be fine with it. Okay, thank you. Any other points for discussion or motions? Okay, let's try the next section. Again, we can go back if, if you have to raise a point after the fact, but uh, housing rehabilitation. Uh, any points for discussion or motions on housing rehabilitation? Chris. Um, I was just going to suggest that policy A be split into two policies because they seem somewhat different. Each each of the two sentences could be their own standing policy. Okay. Uh, so that would be uh, splitting policy A into an inventory policy and then a reexamination policy. Uh, yes. Okay. Um, let me let me just check uh, if if there's any objection to handling that as a scrivener's change. Uh, is there is there any objection within the group to splitting policy A, the two sentences of policy A, uh, into two separate policies? Any objection on that? Okay, so I'm not I'm not hearing any objection uh, to handling it as a Scrivener's change. Uh, so uh, thank you for that feedback, Chris. Um, I got I I do note uh, Chris and Jan both have their hands up still, uh, but I'm thinking those are for existing comments. Uh, any other comments or discussion for the housing rehabilitation section here? I have a question, Charles. 
So uh, on what is now policy C, I was trying to figure out an example of where the county would assist in the rehabilitation of substandard housing units so I could understand it better. Bill, do you know of actions taken under that policy? Uh, we haven't taken any actions because this is a new proposed policy. So for example, um, I'm trying to think. So if we had, say, a program through code compliance where, or maybe a better example would be um, a program through code compliance that would have maybe uh, a rental, not short-term rental, but just regular rental unit registration program. Um, and then, you know, if there was, I'm talking off the fly, so don't take this as a proposed program, but, you know, maybe there's some sort of assistance for low lower income people who need to have housing repairs done maybe they need a handicapped or accessible ramp maybe they need a hole fixed in their roof i don't know something like that okay so this would be this would actually be county funds that would be going to private people in order for them to improve their uh presumably low income housing situation. It could be county. Uh, that's not the way the policy is written, but um, it could be a private non nonprofit organization. It could be a church. Um, but it's basically the intent of the policy is to um, we have a lot of housing where people are living with holes in the roof, holes in the floor, um, you know, holes in the wall, uh, no electricity, broken windows. Um, you know, and so to be able to find ways to encourage that and get that housing stock brought up to standard um, would, would, I thought, be a good thing, but maybe it's not. No, I, I'm, I'm always in favor of, especially if it's through other nonprofits and NGO kind of things. That's great. Gail, could you clarify for me? I, I recognize I've got a couple hands up. I'll go to you two in a second. Um, what the threshold for necessary would be in this case, or or how um, we would determine that? It would have to come through the building code because there is, and I don't know the section and I don't know the wording and I don't know what the threshold is, but there is language in the building code that talks about uh, dangerous or unsafe buildings. So you would have to base your determination on that based going through the building code standards. Okay, all right. Thank you. Uh, so, so it's a determination. So your reading of that is it's a determination based on safety need, something like that. That's a little bit more than safety. I mean, a hole in the wall is really not a safety issue, mm -hmm. um, but if it's letting the cold air and the rain in into a bedroom, I mean, it's not a safety issue per se, but it's, it's definitely a quality of life issue. I would think. Okay. I, I, uh, sorry to dwell on this. I'm, I'm I'm trying to parse out uh, my reading of necessary was more in terms of housing stock as opposed to housing quality, um, but you're taking it in a, a specific direction. Okay, I well, understand that. So, to to maybe go back to your direction, Andy. Yeah. So, um, if you have substandard housing, you've got a building that has holes in the wall, holes in the floor, holes in the ceiling whatever, mm -hmm. no electricity, broken windows. I think we would rather encourage that housing be brought up to standard uh, rather than tearing it down and building again from scratch, which does have an environmental cost to it. And yeah. uh, as you weren't here when Jason was speaking earlier this morning about the cost of building materials and how they've gone up 400% over the last four years. So is it more economically feasible to retain housing stock by making necessary repairs to bring it up to code? Or is it better just to tear the unit down and go back to scratch and, and start over? Yeah, I, well, I have no fundamental issue with, with the policy. I was just trying to understand the impact of that wording. Thank you. Uh, okay, so Jim, Susanna, and then Jan. Jim? Uh, yes, just to add a little more information, the last legislative session, passed a one and a half billion dollars for various types of housing and embedded in that was literally a piece for exactly this policy. 
uh, for retention of, of, of uh, uh, current housing stock. So I would suggest looking at that law. Of course, I don't know how they end up distributing that money, but it, we're talking about millions, but it's across the state though. So uh, I think it's a very appropriate policy, very timely. <coughs> okay, thank you, Jim. Susanna? Somewhere I saw retaining manufactured homes and parks for them and I think that's really important. I know there was a big issue in the city of Astoria about wanting to take out a mobile home park east and and I don't know how I think it was for the one of the hotels, but I think it's something that should maybe be mentioned here. Um, I think manufactured homes might be and also um, the not manufactured home, but the big campers, places for big campers um, to permanently stay. I know there's a campground off of 202, about mile marker 1011. And I just think they might be really important. Susanna, uh, do you have language you'd like to propose to add that in? Add those notions in. <laughs> oh, I'm bad with language. Does anybody did, did else you feel look at, like I feel? In my did you look at policy F immediately above the one we're working on? It it addresses a lot of what you said. I think. Oh, okay. That's what I think I saw. Su Susanna, if you don't mind, um, if if you can review that policy F quickly, and then um, I can come back to you if, if you want to make changes to it. Uh, let, let me go and I'll take Jan's comment and uh, and we can come back to you if, we, if you want us to, okay? Yeah, yes, yes. Thank you. Uh, Jan. Uh, this was just relating to our earlier discussion. I think that's the kind of thing that Clatsop Community Action uh, works on. And um, so there is, you know, there's a nonprofit out there that does that, that would funnel that kind of stuff. And I think uh, having the county support that would be great. On the rehabilitation front? Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay. Thank you. And Jason. Dale, can you, can you go up a little bit? I, the last one we were just working on right there. Um, Oh, sorry, it's the. It was about preserving the houses and shall, the the county shall or possibly um, help in assisting with that. I just, I think it's a great idea. I think you know, as a builder, um, sorry, I'm on my phone again, guys, and I'm I'm having a hard time seeing it. There it is, the housing stock, and where necessarily, where necessary and feasible, will assist with rehabilitation of substandard housing units. I I, I agree with trying to fix what we have i mean i i'm we can't we can't build fast enough it's not possible but we can repair what we have but my my question is is where does that money come from i know that there are state levels but at the county level this is kind of opening opening us up for uh people requesting you know funds and stuff like that is there a process that i don't know about gail or that that uh, a certain tax or or funding for this type of project yeah so there there is no funding and we're not proposing like a construction excise tax or anything like that um so there's it's really unfunded at this point uh one possible source would be uh code compliance fines uh that could be used perhaps to help bring housing up to code so if you had we collect fines from violations uh, once they're closed we collect for the staff time and everything and that goes into an abatement fund so that's one possible source of funding it's not a huge amount maybe we get five to ten thousand a year but um we aren't proposing any new taxes my, my comment on that is I, I think that we should take out will assist with rehabilitation of substandard housing units if we don't have a program in place to fund that 
I, I agree with encourage the retention, um, current stock, um, or maybe come up with a. So, to, Jay, uh, to, let me let me take that as a motion. Uh, I I think you concisely stated it there. Uh, so, I've got a motion to delete the phrase "will assist in." Uh, in policy C under housing rehabilitation. Uh, is, is there a second uh, for the deletion of will assist in? Second. Okay, uh, so I've got a motion and a second uh, for the deletion of the phrase will assist in. Uh, that would uh, leave us with a policy C that reads class of county shall encourage the retention of the current housing stock and where necessary and feasible the real rehabilitation of substandard housing units. Uh, is there a discussion on that motion? Yes. Charles. Um, so I, while I am in agreement with, with what Jason is saying about um, using county funding, uh, when I asked Gail for the example on this particular point, um, she mentioned uh, as a, using uh, nonprofits or NGOs or, or other resources that might be available in the county uh, to assist with this. And I personally, I think that's a great idea. Uh, I think it's a worthwhile goal. And I think it's an appropriate use of county resources to, to somehow you know, match up uh, people who are willing to uh, either provide the funding or provide the work with people who have the need. So that's kind of the way I read the sentence as opposed to reaching in the county coffers to pay for it. Okay, uh, we've got comments from Chris and then Susanna. Chris? Yeah, I, uh, I agree with what Charles just said. I, the way I read it is uh, the weasel word here, and I, I'm sorry for using that expression, but is feasible. Uh, is it feasible for the county? And that's referring to assist, I'm assuming, because assist comes before rehabilitation. So it's not about is it feasible to rehabilitate? Is it feasible to assist in that rehabilitation? That leaves the county all the room it needs. It can simply say, well, we just don't have money set aside for that, it's already allocated to other things. So I don't have a problem with the, the wording as it was before the, the suggested striking of those three words, and, and I would prefer to leave them in to show that the county is committed to actually trying to do something. Maybe they can find somebody with money, an organization or whatever. Okay, thank you, Chris. Susanna? I agree with what Chris, Christopher Forar said. I, he spoke well. Thank you. Okay. Um, any more discussion on this? I'll say for my two cents, I think this makes it cleaner and uh, puts the county in the position of encouraging and puts the... Um, the emphasis for that feasibility on whether the rehabilitation itself was feasible and i'm comfortable with that but uh but let's go to oh pat sorry i was persuaded uh by jason but i think um i think the assist piece is, is an appropriate role for the county in this regard okay thank you pat any any other discussion okay let's go to a vote i think uh we have suitable indication there may be dissension that we should do roll call here um so let me go down my list uh charles andy yeah, can Cheryl. we clarify please yeah, at this we, point yeah. we are we are voting on the amendment correct not on the, not on the motion um so there's there's the main motion is to delete will assist in uh the policy c as as read on the on the page right now, policy C was staff um, suggestion, right? Uh, we don't necessarily even have to have a vote to include policy C, it's just part of the presented material. So all right. we're voting on right now is whether or not to uh, exclude will assist in. Got it, thank you for the clarification. Sure, uh, so, so I'll just restate that. So we're, 
we're voting on an amendment to policy C as presented to delete the phrase will assist in. Um, so we'll do a roll call vote uh, for that item. And I'm going to start with Charles, though frustratingly, my list is sort of changing. So if I miss someone, please let me know. So Charles Dice? No. No. Um, Jan Mitchell? No. Lam Kwan? No. Susanna Gladwin? No. Um, Chris Farrar? Nay. Okay, Clark Powers? No. Uh, let's see, Jason Crowshar, is that the right pronunciation? It's Crowshar and yes. Okay, thank you, Jason. Um, Cheryl, did I get you yet? You did not vote me, did not get me and I vote yes. Okay, Jim Allegria? No. Pat Corcoran? Uh, no. Okay, did I miss anyone in that vote? Okay, uh, so I had a vote of eight to two uh, and the motion fails. Okay, uh, any other feedback or motions uh, for this housing rehabilitation section? Cheryl. Uh, I don't hear you yet, Cheryl, thank you. Do we need a motion to separate what was policy A into now policy A and B? So I asked uh, if we could handle that as a Scrivener's change and asked for objection to that handling and I didn't hear any. Uh, so I was treating it in that way. Do you, uh, do you think different, do you object to that change? No, not at all. And again, thank you for clarifying. Okay. Hey, hey guys, I, I hate to interrupt. I'm sorry, but I have to get off here. I just want to let y'all know that I, I have to go. I've stayed as long as I possibly could. Thank you for letting us know, Jason. Have a good afternoon. Yeah, thank Thanks, you. Guys. Jason, good luck on the field. Hey, thank you very much. Enjoy your, your participation, Jason. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, let me ask again, uh, maybe final time, uh, any other feedback for housing rehabilitation section? Um, I, I want to do a quick time uh, time check for the group here. Uh, so we're at 115. We need to wrap up at 155. Uh, we have a couple of sections here and then um, a shorter, admittedly, goal uh, on ocean policies uh, to follow. Uh, so assisted housing, uh, two policies here. Any feedback for assisted housing? Chris. Uh, I had... Uh, two modifications uh, to consider for policy A. Uh, in the first sentence, which reads, Clatsop County shall set aside tracts of land which it owns within the cities and their urban growth boundaries, which can be used for low cost housing. I wanted to append to that sentence at the very end or other urban uses. And my point on this is that cities are more than just housing and stores and police departments. They're also parks and open spaces and that should be considered when these lands are turned over. And continuing with that theme at the very end of uh, that period. Chris, let, let, sorry, let me take that as a single motion. And if that's all right with you, unless they're well, uh, this this connected. this this second change has to do with the very same thing, and so okay. if you're for one, okay, uh, if you're against it, you'll probably be against both these. At at the very end of the paragraph, I would move to add. However, other urban uses must be considered. So, uh, land, comma, yeah. So, as part of the last sentence. Yes. Okay. Uh, so, however, other urban uses uses must be considered. Must be considered. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so, I've got a motion for by Chris Farrar uh, to insert two pieces of language. Um, so, the first and both in policy A under assisted housing, the first is or other urban uses at the end of the first sentence. 
The second is uh, at the end of the third sentence, uh, the phrase, however, other urban uses must be considered. Um, is there a second for that? I'll second it. Okay, thank you, Jim. So I have a motion and a second. Uh, I will note procedurally, if anyone wants to consider them separately, you can make a motion to consider them separately, um, or we can discuss them as a whole, uh, as suggested by the motion maker. Uh, so let's start with discussion here. Uh, is there any discussion on the on these two additions? And and Gail, I'm sorry to be a stickler about this, but can I ask you to change the um, the however part to a comma leading into a, a lowercase um, h. Thank you. Um, Chris, uh, is your hand up for discussion? Yeah, and I'll make this real brief. I just thought maybe an example might um, make it more clear why I was wanting to insert this language. Uh, the county owns a piece of a sizable piece of property in the city of Astoria's urban growth boundary. It's very close to the transfer station, if you know where that is, and it's across the street from uh, uh, Shively Park. And if that land were turned over to the city, I think one of the best uses for it would be to increase park and open space land. If you know the area, you'd understand why I say that. And rather than try to develop that into housing, like that's the only possible use of it. So that's, that's an example of why I wanted to consider other possible uses. And then maybe some open space within the city could be used for housing that would be more reasonable site. Okay, thank you, Chris. Um, I'm gonna recognize Gail and then Clark. Okay, um, I just wanted to have some clarification on how the other urban uses ties into what that sentence is talking about, which is construction techniques. Um, so I just need some clarification if we're making that all one sentence, how, how the other urban uses relates to construction techniques or lot parcel layout. Chris, do you have any feedback on that? Well, it, it goes to the idea that neighborhoods and uh, uh, residential areas have more than just houses on them. It, it could be uh, used as green space around a small development of land or part of it might be used that way. I don't, I don't think it's too difficult to get at the idea that um, you might develop some low cost housing in an area that had been owned by the county and given to the city, but that part of that land was retained for open space for those local residents. That's what I'm trying to get at. Maybe my wording isn't very good. Gail, does that answer your question or uh, do you? Do you have suggestions about changing to wording to? No, I have no suggestions, thank you. Okay. Um, Clark, uh, it looks like your hand just went down, but did you have a comment? Well, no, uh, Gail's question was going to be my question, so no, thank you. Okay, okay. thank you, sir. Okay, any other uh, discussion on these two insertions? Okay, I'm not seeing any other uh, hands at the Jan, moment. Jan had her hand up. Oh, Jan. Um, I'd be more comfortable with with the first uh, addition, but I'm I'm really uncomfortable with the second. Not because I don't agree with Chris about it. Just seems awkward, and it it doesn't seem to fit when you're talking about clustering techniques to to throw that in. Uh, I think saying it, saying it, saying it once is sufficient for the policy. Jan, uh, can I take that as a motion to consider these as uh, separate? Yes, you okay. may. 
uh, so I've got a, a motion to consider uh, these two insertions as separate items. Uh, is there a second to that motion? Second. Thank you, Cheryl. Um, let me ask if there's any discussion on this uh, quickly. Uh, actually, I'm just going to ask, is there any objection to considering these separately? OK, I'm not hearing objection to considering these two revisions separately. Um, so let's have we've already had some discussion on these two. Uh, let's try for a vote on the first one. Uh, so we've got a motion uh, which was seconded uh, to add in policy the first sentence of policy A for other urban uses at the end of the sentence. So it would read class of county shall set aside tracts of lands which it owns within the cities and their urban growth boundaries which can be used for low cost housing or other urban uses. Um, so let me ask, is there any objection to the insertion of or other urban uses? Okay, uh, I'm not hearing any objection. So I think that part passes. Uh, so let's, I'm, because there's some dissension and maybe someone will suggest uh, alternative language here, uh, let's consider this second motion. So this motion is to add uh, the phrase, however other urban uses must be considered to the end of the sentence, uh, the last sentence of policy A, so that it would read clustering techniques, common wall and townhouse construction, both for sale and for rent could be employed in the development of these lands. However, other urban uses must be considered. Is there any um, discussion on that or alternative language to propose? So I'm not seeing hands here or discussion. So let's go to a vote on this one. I sense that there may be some dissension. So let me try uh, for a voice vote first. Uh, so this motion is to add uh, to the last sentence of policy A, the phrase, however, other urban uses must be considered. Uh, let me ask uh, all those in favor of the addition of this phrase, could you please signify by saying aye? Aye. 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 Okay, and then all of those opposed to the addition of this phrase, could you signify by saying nay? Nay. I think that's awfully close, but I think the nays have it. This what? is your opportunity to call for a <laughs> call vote if you want it, but I think the nays have it there. I call for a vote. Okay. Fair enough. Um, so we'll go through and, and have a vote on that. Uh, so let's start with Cheryl. So I'll, just to restate, this is a vote on the insertion of however other urban uses must be considered. Cheryl, how do you vote on that insertion? Nay. Um, Jan, how do you vote on that insertion? Nay. Pat, how do you vote on that insertion? Yay. Uh, sorry, was that a um, Yay as an affirmative, yes. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying. Um, Charles Dice? Yes. Chris Farrar? Aye. Uh, Clark Powers? Nay. I'm sorry, Clark, just to, yes, no. No, no. no. okay. Um, Jim Allegria? Yes. Lam Kwong? No. Susanna Gladwin. Yes. Okay, I have a vote of five to four. The yeses have it. Oh, congrats. Motion passes. Uh, thank you for checking my uh, hearing of the vote there. Okay, uh, so we have two additions uh, that have passed there. Uh, let me go back to the floor. Are there any other motions or discussion for the assisted housing section? Let me try then uh, for unsheltered persons section, housing policies, unsheltered persons. Any discussion or motions on this section? Susanna. I actually think we 
miss the piece on manufactured home parks. We were going to come back to it. Oh, so I, well, so I apologize if I wasn't clear. I, I thought that um, you were going to review it. And if there were things, uh, if there was something you wanted changed, you could bring it up. Um, do, do you have a change to suggest? Yes. Okay. I think that limiting it to manufactured homes, uh, sh I think it should be open to campers and tiny homes, perhaps. Some so, tiny homes, I think, are movable. Um, Susanna, can I suggest uh, language here, which would just be um, the replacement of the phrase manufactured homes with residences to, to broadly cover things that people might be living in? Did you say, my, my sound isn't great. You said oh, residences? Correct. That, that was my suggestion. But I, yeah, I, I'm not sure if that really defines it. I would just say campers and tiny homes, including campers and tiny homes. So, so you're suggesting manufactured homes. Yes, manu alteration of manufactured homes, comma campers, comma and tiny homes. Okay. Uh, Okay, um, Susanna, I, I think I've, I've got your, your comment there. I do want to recognize Gail, just put her hand up. Uh, so manufacturing, yep, yeah. Gail. Okay. So um, under the building codes, there's some question about whether tiny homes are really what they're considered and RVs are not considered a residence um, because they don't, they only have one escape route and they don't meet the, the definition or the code requirements to be a residence. So I'm a little concerned that if we do that, we're going to be basically encouraging and legalizing people to live in RVs, which people do anyway, but they're not covered by any code at all. So I'm a little, whereas manufactured homes are covered under certain building code requirements, you can do whatever you want, but I'm just throwing that out there for information. All right, uh, thank you for that feedback, Gail. Uh, Susanna, does that lead you to want to change your motion at all? I, I do have a motion from you on the floor. Yes, I. Well, there's no, it does not say residences in here. And so I don't think that conflict I, should I, come I, in. I, I think I, it's I think to, a to clear, solution to, as a place. I, I think to clarify, I think what Gail is saying is that we we don't include those as residences in the code presently um, as a legal designation, but including them them in this policy as part of uh, a, a, a broader uh, legal framework might end up uh, complicating their to the legal designation of tiny homes and campers within the county framework. Yes, I I understand that. Okay. Um, the reality is lots of people are in campers and they are sometimes in inappropriate places and I think they should be sometimes, which I think they are sometimes. Um, and I just, you know, that's what I would like to see included, and that's open for discussion. Okay. Um, some of that was a little blurry, but uh, I, it sounded like you were saying you just wanted to put it up for discussion. That's fair. Uh, so before I go to the other hands, so there's a motion on the floor to insert um, after manufactured homes, the phrase tiny homes and campers. Uh, let me check. Is there a second for that motion? Is there a second to include tiny homes and campers uh, within policy F? Is 
We'll check one more time. Is there a second for the motion? So I believe that that motion dies for lack of a second. And just to confirm, uh, Chris, Jim, could you shake your heads or nod? Uh, are you uh, seconding with your hand up there? Uh, <clears throat> this is Chris. No. This is Chris. I guess the logical thing would have been for me to second so I could comment on it. But I just wonder if there could be something that carries this thought forward as an individual policy, not claiming that mobile homes are, um, I mean, that uh, campers are, uh, are homes, but that some parking area that the county consider the possibility of developing some parking areas for multiple parking spaces for uh, campers. You know, that that's a possibility. I can, I can see the usefulness of doing that, but maybe it doesn't belong in housing at all. Maybe that belongs in some other goal. I don't know. But those are my thoughts. I'm, I'm not taking that as a second. Um, so I am going to treat this as uh, dying for lack of a second. Um, let me let me just ask uh, any other feedback for this policy F uh, on uh, mobile home parks before we move on. Jim, is your hand up for for feedback on this? Okay, Jim. Uh, yes, uh, I I like to split this. The Susanna bringing up the concept of tiny homes I think deserves a a separate policy and discussion on that. I am opposed of having campers included in policy F or actually being treated as a home for the reasons that uh, that director uh, Hendrickson has has brought up. So, so I'm, I'm looking at parsing this out. So uh, not in here, no. So do you have a separate policy to suggest, Jim? Well, I'd like to have an open discussion on the concepts of tiny homes because uh, they are included in uh, in uh, in code in other cities, but we have not touched upon that, and I think we do need to have a discussion on it. So, okay. if you want me to make a motion just for the sake of of creating discussion, I can do that. That that is my preference, sir. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Do you, so, uh, go ahead. Uh, I uh, have a motion to. Uh, allow tiny homes in residential districts that follow the, the standard uh, rules for other types of residences. In other words, what I'm getting at is they have to have sewer and water, uh, you know, those types of things. Um, Jim, can I suggest that we put that under uh, the residential development section? Uh, would you sure. would you accept that as a change, just because it's no, the yeah, strategies no report section? I think you just passed it, Gail. Sorry, um, where all that big cluster of additions is. Okay, so I've got a motion uh, for a policy O uh, in res. Residential development, is that the, sorry, yeah. Uh, in residential development, uh, policy O, to allow tiny homes in residential districts that follow the standard rules for other type of, types of residences. Is there a second for that motion? I'll second. Okay, uh, so I have a motion and a second uh, for the inclusion of this policy O as on the screen. I do want to, um, again, give a little time check. We've got 20 minutes left in our meeting for today. Um, I think it seems sort of unlikely we'll get to ocean policies, but uh, just as a guide for how we think about the wrapping up this part. Uh, Lam, do you have feedback on this? Yes, I have a question. Uh, what we consider as, as tiny home, are they um, mobile or are they um, attached? Like mm, would be an ADU? Um, what, what's, what's the definition on this? Uh, I guess. Uh, question for Jim. 
Well, I, I, I don't have a specific definition. I know the city of Portland allows them. So my suggestion is if it passes, uh, the uh, staff has plenty of, of opportunity to, to uh, look at it, a specific definition. I'd also, uh, and, and it is not an ADU, these are standalone. Uh, they could be clustered. Uh, there are, this is sort of a uh, off the cuff type of a, of a policy because it shouldn't be residential districts, should be residential zones. And there could be some special areas that are included or excluded for this. I'm not sure exactly what would make the most sense for the county, but the concept of having or allowing uh, tiny homes, I think is a really good one because this is something that's affordable uh, that could be implemented uh, well, it is affordable. And, and so uh, then, uh, you know, individuals can determine whether or not that uh, they would like to uh, cite one of these. Okay, thank you, Jim. Gail, uh, just for my edification, is there anything in current code um, about tiny homes, uh, defining them at all within the county? No, nothing within the county. And we do not have a minimum house size. Uh, my understanding in discussions with the building official is that the difference is if it is on wheels and remains on wheels, it's basically considered an RV. Um, if you attach it to the ground, just like you would a standard stick built home or a manufactured home, then it's fine. Um, that's okay. my basic understanding. All right, thank you. Okay, any other discussion on this policy O? Well, well, without beating a dead uh, brontosaurus here, uh, could, could we consider possibly making it a little more flexible to the county with a few introductory words saying uh, Clatsop County um, should consider allowing and then the rest of the policy? In other words, the idea would be the county would propose that they're considering this and, and maybe have a public meeting or have, no uh, I, I think that's that's a good idea chris okay so so i've got a motion to amend uh by inserting the words class of county should consider allowing uh to allowing replace homes allow in residential in residential zones not not districts Uh, Chris, do you do you accept? We haven't asked for a second yet. Do you accept zones as a change too? Yes, I do. Okay, so we've got some um, a, a compound motion to amend uh, to insert Clatsop County should uh, consider allowing and to replace districts with zones uh, in policy O. Uh, is there a second for that? I'll second that. Okay, thank you, Clark. Uh, Gail, you have your hand up, I'll recognize you. Yeah, so I just wanna be clear, the county, um, it's not that we have a prohibition against tiny homes. I mean, if you own a piece of property and you wanna put a tiny home on it, that's fine. Where we run into the issue um, is if you, and if your property is zoned for an ADU, you can do a tiny home as an ADU. Um, we, we have to change our codes though, based on the new state, Senate Bill 391 to allow accessory dwelling units of any size uh, in their rural lands. So I just want to be clear, it's not that we have prohibited tiny homes based on aesthetics or size or character of neighborhood. It's that state statute until recently did not give the county a choice. So um, I think we're already kind of doing this, but uh, if you want to make it more formalized in a, in a formal policy, that's fine. But I just wanted to make everybody aware that we were. Thank you, Gail. Uh, so let me, let me ask quickly, is there any further discussion on this amendment, on the language amendment here? Let me ask, is, is there any objection uh, to the amendment to change the language to insert Clatsop County should consider allowing and to change uh, districts to zones. Is there any objection to those two changes? Okay, hearing no objection, we'll go back to the main motion, uh, which now reads Clatsop County 
uh, should consider allowing tiny homes in residential zones that follow the standard rules for other types of residences. Uh, any further discussion on that amended language? Any further discussion? Okay, let me, let's go to a vote here. Any objection from the group uh, for the motion to include policy O uh, reading, Clatsop County should consider allowing tiny homes in residential zones that follow the standard rules for other types of residences. Any objection to that addition? Hearing no objection, uh, that policy passes. Uh, let us, again, I'll, I'll do a, a quick time check here. Um, we're back at unsheltered persons, the last section of housing policies. Uh, any uh, discussion or motions for unsheltered persons? Susanna. I think the issue of campers should be studied by the county because so many people are now living in campers. And are they homeless if they're in a camper or not? But it's also a solution on a homeless camp, a sanctioned homeless camp. So maybe just that the county should study the issue of camper use on county lands. Can I suggest within the county? instead of on county lands, only because I read that as sure. county owned property. Um, gotcha. Sorry, uh, Andy, could you repeat? Yeah, I, I just said uh, to use within the county instead of on county lands, because I think of that as county owned property. Um, okay, uh, let me ask for a second for that. So we've got a Motion to include policy D, the county should study the issue of camper use within the county. Uh, is there a second for that motion? I'll second it. Okay, uh, so we've got a motion and a second to include this policy D. Uh, any discussion on the policy? Chris. Uh, it, it, my my uh, comment has to do with the, the what's included in use, um, obviously, people use campers while in the county for all kinds of reasons so you're here you're i think trying to get at the idea that the camper would remain stationary or return to the same sort of parking area night after night for some extended period of time and serve as a shelter i just think the way the sentence reads now it's 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 not clear what camper uses <laughs> You're Chris, including. Chris, can I suggest um, amendment language camper use for housing within the county? Sounds good to me. And okay. we only have a couple uh, minutes left. Okay, so we've got a motion to amend uh, by inserting the words for housing uh, after camper use. Is there a second for that motion? Second. I'll second it. Okay, any objection to the insertion of for housing? Any objection to that language change? Okay, so hearing no objection there. Uh, thank you, Chris, for the suggestion. So back to the main motion of an insertion of policy D, uh, the county should study the issue of camper use for housing within the county. Any further discussion on that policy? Yes. Okay, Pat. Um, I, should I make a motion to change the word camper? which is an individual with, or, or are we talking motor homes? And is that a distinction with a difference? Um, Gail, uh, is there a inclusive term for um, RVs, uh, camper trailers, et cetera, uh, that would be preferred here? I think we typically go with recreational vehicle. I don't think we have a definition of camper in the code. Okay. Uh, because this isn't, I mean, maybe this is. I mean, then when I interpret camper, that can be tents, sleeping bags, all the way up to class A motor homes. And I don't know if there's a distinction to be made. Uh, Pat, would you be comfortable if we're, if 
you're suggesting an amendment to change to recreational vehicle? Yes. Okay, uh, so I have a motion to amend by changing camper to recreational vehicle. Is there a second for that motion? Second. Second. Okay, I have a motion and a second to change camper to recreational vehicle. Is there any objection to that change? Okay, so I'm hearing no objection. Uh, so that change passes. And I apologize that I'm kind of rushing through these. I'm just trying to make sure we get it in uh, under the wire here and let Gail go to her other uh, obligations. Um, okay, so uh, we have a policy D. The county should study the issue of recreational vehicle use for housing within the county. Um, is there any further discussion on that policy D? Cheryl. I think this has already been addressed at the county level. The problems with campers are that they don't have uh, garbage pickup. They don't have um, sewage. They don't have any of those things that, that we've already talked about um, that we need to keep places livable. And we have a, a addressed sort of expanding rec camper situations um, in previous issues. So. I will be voting against this one. Okay. Thanks, Cheryl. Any other discussion on this? Okay. Uh, let's, uh, Jim. Uh, I just want to uh, address uh, Cheryl's concern. Uh, I understand your concern. This policy, though, says county shall study the issue. And I'm sure those things that you brought up will be part of the issue. Uh, that uh, that will need to be addressed. So this isn't a carte blanche. Uh, it's like uh, there are known issues with recreational vehicles. And to me, I, my interpretation, it allows the county to look into it and seeing if there's some kind of a, a solution to those issues, but yet allowing people to live in RVs. Thank you, Jim. Okay, uh, let me, I don't see any other hands at the moment and not hearing voices. Uh, so let's go to a vote on this one. Uh, let me try first by voice, voice vote. I know there's a, some objection, but let's see how much. Uh, so let me reread the policy. So this is for an inclusion of policy D under unsheltered persons. The county should study the issue of recreational vehicle use for housing within the county. Uh, all those in favor of the insertion of that policy signify by saying aye. 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 And all those opposed to the inclusion of that policy signify by saying no. No. Okay, uh, I believe the ayes have it uh, and the motion carries. Let me make one last check. Are there any other items to consider for unsheltered persons? Okay, so hearing no other items, um, is there any objection to us closing uh, the discussion of the housing goal, goal 10 housing? Eight. Any objection to us moving on and closing out our discussion of goal 10 housing? Okay, seeing and hearing no hands, no objections. Uh, I think we can close up our discussion of housing. Thank you all for our discussion today. Gail, any administrative matters for us to consider? Um, when would be our next meeting, et cetera? Yeah, so our next meeting, uh, theoretically our final meeting for the time being uh, would be April 26. Uh, we'll be looking at goal 19 and uh, going back to goal five. I know that you've asked for a discussion about um, safe harbor rules for wetlands. Uh, so we would bring that back to you. Uh, the remaining goals that we haven't looked at, 16, 17, and 18, uh, we are requesting budget funds for fiscal year 22, 23 to hire a consultant to work on those goals. So really with the completion of goal 19 and goal five next month, that would conclude your work for the time being. Uh, we've also contracted with Oregon's Kitchen Table to do public outreach on the comp plan. Uh, we had our first meeting with them last Monday, and they will be putting together uh, two in-person events and one uh, 
virtual event and an online survey uh, between now and July when we're expecting to uh, move forward with the adoption of the goals that we've reviewed to date. And other than that, I think that's all I have. So thank you. And thank okay. you all for your work today. Um, I'm, I'm a bit out of order. Thank you, Gail. I'm a bit out of order on the agenda here. Uh, but let me check before we adjourn. Is there any public comment at this time? Is there any comment from the public uh, about the processes that we are undertaking to update the comp plan? Okay, uh, hearing no public comment or input at this time. Is there any objection to us adjourning? Any objection to us adjourning at this time? Okay, then I think we'll see uh, see you all on April 26th. Thank you for the meeting today.